Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. What an amazing uh, week it's been. An amazing day, hopefully, for all of you guys. Um, I, <laughs> I absolutely realize that today is Thanksgiving and uh, might not necessarily be the best, uh, the best scheduling for a live stream, but you know what? These things live on YouTube after the fact on my YouTube channel under the live category under my videos. So if you're not watching this live or you know somebody who wants to and they're too busy, either passed out from eating too much turkey or with family or traveling, whatever else. Hey, well, you can watch it whenever you want. So there you go. Um, as always, and uh, I feel like a tool for even saying it, but if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. Follow me on all my socials. Help me keep this thing going by uh, spreading the word if you can. And I, uh, I like, I absolutely love doing these, and I'm having a really great time doing them. Um, and I want to do more, and I want want to do them more often. So, um, what's up, everybody? I'm checking out the chat here. Dude, awesome. Cool. Uh, I see a couple of questions popping up already. Let's hold tight for questions. We'll do today's. Actually, I'm not going to probably today's not going to be a marathon three hour video like the last couple have been. Um, today's going to be covering something just more a conversational uh, opinion on, uh, you know, a certain part of the process, production process for us. And that's mastering. So um Hold your questions till the end. We'll do like a very like open-ended Q&A at the very end. So uh, like I said, we're not going to go too long on this. That also being said, like I probably underestimated how much work these things actually are, uh, at least kind of getting them set up, getting them planned out, mapping them out, and then trying to do all the post stuff af after the fact. So if there is anybody, I, I see a lot of kind of the same names every week, and I, I a lot of you guys reach out in DMs uh, th through my Instagram and YouTube here. I love it. Awesome. Keep that coming. I'm just going to throw this out there. If anybody wants to volunteer to do show notes and or even just take timestamps so, so it's really easy to do the chapters, um, please feel free to just like shoot me a comment or shoot me a DM on one of the platforms or um, just raise your hand. I, that would be awesome. Just kind of uh, would love a little bit of help on that end because it's, it's tough to, to go back and uh, watch myself uh, cringe worthy, uh, <laughs> cringe worthy viewing for the person who's actually uh, doing the recording. So <laughs> anyways, but yeah, timestamps for the chapters. So anybody else who watches after the fact, it's so much easier for them. So uh, oh, Jay, Jay, buddy, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Jay Russell just volunteered. So love that. Um, I'll reach out to you afterwards and we'll, uh, we'll just, you know, or I'll give you my email and you can do the timestamps, shoot me it and I'll put it in the, the, uh, the chapter. So that's awesome. Anyways, man, where to start, where to start, where to start. Um, I think a good place to start is this, the, I've had three projects over the last probably two months that, um, I've gone to mastering and all of a sudden conversations start happening that shouldn't be happening at the mastering stage. Um, I actually had somebody reach out to me on, uh, on Facebook asking just for my opinion on a mix that, you know, they were doing and they said, yeah, they're, they're happy with the mix, but they're just not, the mastering's not quite right. And it just really started sparking this conversation that I seem to be having over and over and over again. So I thought it was worth a conversation thought it was worth maybe just exploring some of the uh, thoughts and philosophies on what exactly mastering is, what it should, what it is, what it isn't. Um, maybe equalizing the, uh, the expectation a little bit. Um, I'm pretty lucky. I get to work with some of the top mastering engineers in the world. Um, and it, you'd be amazed uh, at how many of them probably feel very similar to me, even though, you know, everybody wants to, you know, put their stamp on, on these productions that we're working on. Everybody wants to, to contribute. Everybody wants to be involved, but at the end of the day, you got to do what's right for the song. You got to do what's right for the record. You got to do what's right for the artist. And sometimes when it comes to mastering, that means not doing much at all. And that's sometimes a hard thing to swallow. That's sometimes a hard thing to kind of justify charging a fee for, but 
What we're going to do today is just talk a little bit about what mastering is, so that way maybe that misconception can be can be put to rest a little bit, or at least maybe we can offset it a little bit. So, so in preparation for this, I, I, I was having a couple conversations with some colleagues, and we were talking about like you know when you send out a mix for mastering, like what's the expectation? What do you what are you trying to what what is ma what is mastering even doing? What is it trying to achieve? And Again, I'm I'm having these conversations with people who've been making records for 20, sometimes 30, 40 years. And it's amazing how even guys who have been doing this on a high level for a long time, there's there's a little bit of a differing opinion as to what that expectation or what the um what the goal of sending a song out for mastering is. So one of the things I wanted to pull up here, I just I was poking around doing a little bit of research and I went to like just the the most obvious simple uh, uh, resource we can find. Okay, here's Wikipedia. Okay, so we're gonna go to Wikipedia here, and I just typed in mastering. Okay, I'm gonna read you a little excerpt here, and you guys can all go check this out, obviously, or you know wherever you like to get your your information from online. But mastering, a form of audio post production is the process of preparing and transferring recorded audio from a source containing the final mix to data storage, the source from which all copies be produced. In recent years, digital masters have become usual, although analog masters such as audio tapes are still being used by manufacturing industry, particularly a few engineers who specialize in analog mastering. Mastering requires critical listening. However, software tools exist to facilitate the process. Results depend upon the intent of the engineer, their skills, the accuracy of their speaker monitors, and the listening environment. Okay, let's really pay attention to that one for a second. Mastering engineers often apply equalization and dynamic range compression in order to optimize sound translation on all playback systems. It is a standard practice to make a copy of a master recording known as a safety copy, in this case, master's lost damage or stroke. Okay, a lot of that is a little bit like old-timey, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I was working, I was making records back then, but a lot of that was like very like tape manufacturing stuff like that. We're dealing with streaming, right? So when we go down to, when you scroll down a little bit, it talks a little bit about more of the digital uh, nature of mastering, but here's the part that I really wanted to dive in on. This is what I thought I was actually going to start typing this up on my own. And then I'm like, man, with somebody Wikipedia has basically done my homework for me, which was awesome. But the steps of process typically include the following. Transferring the recorded audios into a digital workstation. I mean, this is, this is a little too like step-by-step, -step, of course, right? Sequence, sequence the separate songs or tracks as they will appear on the album or final release. That's if we're talking about an album. Adjust the, the, the length of the silence between the songs. Process or sweeten the audio to maximize the sound quality for the intended medium. Uh, and then transfer all the audio to a final master format, whatever that happens to be. Okay. Excuse me. Um, examples of possible actions taken during mastering. Oops, sorry, where are we here? Editing minor flaws, apply, applying noise reduction to eliminate clicks, dropouts, hums, and hiss, adjusting stereo width, equalize audio tracks for the purpose of optimized frequency distribution, adjust volume, dynamic range, compression, or expansion, peak limit, inserting ISRC codes and a CD text, or uh, some people just call it, refer to that as metadata, uh, arranging tracks in their final sequential order, if it's an album, and fading out the ending of each song, which hilariously enough, back in the day, like there used to be like fade guys, right? They had like the magic touch on the fade. So um, that's not such a big deal for us anymore, but still it's, it's, it's a part of the process. And it's amazing how many times I've been involved with projects where the mastering engineer typically these days doesn't get too much um, direction on fades, right? They can listen to the mix. They can listen to the rough mix. We kind of build a lot of that stuff in now. Uh, and they just kind of clean it up and make it a little bit more palatable for whatever, you know, if there's a big, if the fade's too long or if there's a big bunch of empty space at the end. And then dither here. So depending on on what the format is, um, they'll they'll add the proper dither and if it's going to CD um, or if they're just giving you a, a, a lower resolution file for uh, streaming and various platforms still want 16441. A lot, the, a lot of the masters I get back now are in whatever resolution I give it to them in. So if I give them a 2496 file, that's what they give back to me. Um, and like I said, record companies still want 1644 ones. They, you know, CDs still 
kind of exist, I think. <laughs> um, and some of the streaming platforms, that's actually what they want when you're uploading as well. So anyways, that's like a super like brief yet accurate representation of what mastering is. So here's, here's the disconnect. Here's the disconnect, okay? We as mixers and producers, and I'll, 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 if I say mixer, I also, I also mean producer, because ultimately the producer should be making the final decision, even though the mixers may be like the person who's the conduit between the, the final mix and the mastering engineer. So anytime I say mixer, insert producer. Anytime I say producer, most of the time you can insert mixer as well, but not that it's the same person, but you know what I'm saying. So here's where the disconnect is. There seems to be um, an expectation that the mastering engineer is somehow going to substantially change or improve the overall sonics of, and I, sonics might actually not be the right word. Let's just say like vibe or quality or insert whatever adject, adject, eh, adjective you would like. <laughs> Tongue twister there for a second. Um, insert whatever word you'd like to describe like just the overall sound of the mix or of the record. And in my personal experience, and maybe everybody's got a little bit of a different experience, but I've had a considerable amount of experience being the guy who sends out the final mix, gets the master back, has to compare the two, has to be the conduit with the mastering engineer, do revisions, make requests, whatever, right? I'm kind of quality control on most of the projects that I worked on and pretty much have been for the last 10 to 15 years. My expectation is not that I'm going to give a mastering engineer a 7 out of 10 and it's going to come back like a 9 out of 10. Um, I have been in scenarios not with the most of the, not with the mastering engineers that I typically use actually sometimes the band or the producer I'm mixing for because to pick or chooses the mastering engineer but I have been in situations where I've delivered what I think is like a nine nine and a half mix and the mastering engineers turn that into an eight um, that's obviously not a good scenario but there's very few scenarios where the 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 expectation is I'm gonna give somebody something a mix to master and it gets comes back drastically different and i can boil it down to like one quick simple statement if that is your expectation if if you are hoping and crossing your fingers that when you send your mix out to a mastering engineer and it's you're like this is going to be so great when it gets back oh dude wait till you hear this it's going to be amazing if that's what you got going on in your head your mix isn't done your mix is not done your mix is not good enough to be mastering yet because that's not going to happen and it shouldn't happen. And that should not be the expectation of what it should be. Okay. So let's start at the beginning of this a little bit. So actually I've, I've, I actually, we're going to listen to some audio today. Um, cause I just got a master back from a song that I mixed. Uh, it's unreleased. So we're just going to be dealing with instrumentals here, but, um, a, a really, really cool band. Uh, I believe they're from Denmark. Um, they allowed me to use this song, and and when it come when it gets released, I'll I'll put in the comments the whole thing. It's a really cool song, but we're dealing with instrumentals. But I just got masters back from a mix I did for this band. Um, Howie Weinberg and Will Borza mixed this, and they're they're people that I use often for for mastering, and they're they're top notch. I mean, look, just go look at Howie's resume, and you'll just be blown away. So like this is this is what we're going to be dealing with today is real world, a mix that I did for a paying client and sent out to, I'm going to show you the files that I sent out to Howie. I'm going to show you what he sent me back. And we're going to talk a little bit about kind of like what exactly that looks like, how I went about doing that, what it is that my expectation is in from getting a master back. Um, and ultimately just kind of like the, the purpose of mastering, I guess, like, so Anyways, here we go. Um, any questions before I before I dig in, kind of mastering related or any anything that I've uh, anything that I've kind of said so far. Same with the nine to an eight, or in my case, it came back a four. <laughs> Jordan, that's hilarious. Yeah, you know what? It's 
I always say with mastering, I mean, I've got a bunch of, you know, stupid little phrases or little themes that I say uh, when it comes to mastering, but, um, and I don't mean this in, in a, in a insulting way whatsoever, but it's like, it's, I think the, the sign of a great mastering engineer is somebody who knows what not to do as opposed to somebody who thinks they know what to do and add, adds a bunch of stuff or, you know, and here's the other thing. I don't, I don't do any mastering at all. And here's the reason why. Well, there's a couple of reasons why, but the main reason why is I know I would, I, I have, I, I would right out of the gate have a tendency to do too much. I would over EQ, I would over compress, I would over widen. I would just like, like just too much. Um, and that's not what this game is about. And if the, if that's what the expectation is, or if that's what you think you're going to get from a mastering engineer, then we're just, you, you, this, this is going to be a great video for you because I think it, it will hopefully clarify some of that. So anyways, I'm going to play. Um, oh, hang on. We got a question. What do they do to make it an eight? Are there any trends you notice? Not the first time I've heard this. Okay, yeah, cool. This is actually, this is a great question. And once we start listening to audio, it'll probably be a little bit more, you know what? I wish I had a really, I, you know what I should have done? I should have mastered this song. And I should, before I got Howie's back, I should have done a master of this and just like see if I could fuck it up. <laughs> I'd probably fuck it up. No, but here's, here's what I would say the, the trends are that I see. And it's not even, I'm not, I'm not trying to give mastering engineers a bad name here, a bad rep, because that's not what this is about. What I would say the, the trend is, mixing engineers and or producers expect the mastering engineer to almost do like the last 10% of the mix. Meanwhile, you've only given them a left and a right, and they really don't have a lot to work with. And so... Whatever you send out to a mastering engineer, I think ultimately they are going to assume that's the best you can get it. Um, but if, the, you know, like I, I, I saw something on um, either Instagram or YouTube last week or something, and somebody said something about, you know, uh, oh man, I really love the, the, the mastering on that album is blah, 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 whatever. I really love like the vibe and what, and I'm like the vibe. And somebody actually said that in the comments. They're like, the vibe? Question mark? They're like, the ma mastering engineer vibe? Like, we're talking about a song that was written by a musician, that was recorded by an engineer, that was probably edited, that was probably... Like, all of these things. And it's like, the mastering engineer added vibe. I'm like, what possibly was were they doing to change it that drastically that it was kind of like, eh, the song doesn't have a lot of vibe, Mastering engineer X gets his hands on it. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, now we got a hit on our hands. Like I don't, I, I can't comprehend that scenario. And then I think a lot of my colleagues and a lot of the people that, even the mastering engineers that I work with, I think they would probably agree. And I think the trend is mix engineers and or producers sending mastering engineers subpar, sub quality mixes and expecting them to do some sort of heavy lifting without then somehow I don't want to say wrecking something else, but it's like, you know, if you send, if you send a mastering and an engineer, a, a mix where you've just got way too much 200 Hertz in the snare drum, because you just, that's, you're like, oh, I just want it to sound big and thuddy. And you've added so much 200 Hertz into the snare drum that the only way for them to balance out this mix is to pull out 200. Even if you're doing it dynamically on, on every snare hit, well, that 200 is now coming out of everything else. So yeah, the mastering engineers can do some amazing stuff. But there's going to be trade-offs. So if you send a mastering engineer a mix and then you're like, man, the snare's just a little too thuddy. It's just a little too big and a little too woofy. Can you do something there? And it's like, that, that's, that's, that's the mix engineer's job. That's a mix problem. So I think the trend is expecting heavy lifting by the mastering engineer. That's not his job. I don't want him doing that. I want him as final quality control. I want I want them to be able to if we're doing an album to let the album play down in a sequence and make it sound cohesive. Cause that's another thing that I think a lot of people, a lot of things get lost. People are so zoomed in on, I want this to sound like that 
you know, bring me the horizon album. Let's make it sound like that. And then the next song, they're like, I want this to sound like that, you know, Papa Roach song. And now I want this to sound like a Nickelback song. And it's kind of like, are these going on the same album? Because if you start trying to match top end and bottom end to all these different records, and now they're playing on, you're playing an album, it's going to sound so disjointed. Some songs based off the key, based off the tempo, based off the production, even if all of the sounds are the same, even if all the mix settings are the same, some songs are going to have more bottom end. Some songs are going to have more top end. You have to, the mastering engineer, part of their job with an album or a cohesive piece of work is to make that kind of all work together. Now that doesn't mean track two needs to match track seven necessarily. What we like to try to do is make make sure one goes into two, two goes into three, three goes into four. Obviously streaming, you're jumping all over the place and there's no real album these days anyways, but that's my concern. And yeah, you know what? I want it to sound cohesive um, you know, from track to track regardless of the, the running order, um, but it's a little bit less of a concern, especially with levels and high end and low end and that type of thing. Uh, but again, we're talking subtleties here. If I want low end, more low end in my kick drum, I'm going to add more low end in my kick drum before I even print a mix. And that's what you guys should be doing too. So that's one trend. That's a trend. That's not a that's not on the mastering engineer. Um, the tr Like I said, I'm pretty lucky because a lot of the mastering guys that I work with are like the best in the business. And I'm just very fortunate to be able to be working with those guys and sending them stuff to where I'm not seeing a lot of like the really terrible trends. Um, I'm hearing about them but I'm not having to experience them the same way that some of you guys might be. Um, obviously level is a thing. And I would say if there is a revision that I'm doing the most often with mastering engineers, even the top guys, it's usually, it's usually a, a, a dynamic range thing. It's kind of like, how hot do we want to go? Is it too hot? Is it not hot enough? It's, it's hot, but we've lost something. We've, you know, the snare transients aren't being like are, are, are now just too much in the mix. Um, and that's something I'm going to actually talk about a little bit because there is also, because everything has gotten so squashed dynamically, um, my mix process has changed. I'd say in the last five years, my mix process has changed. And I'll talk about that when we go to the, to the session here, but, um, level is a big thing. And then also just over EQing. And again, it's like, I would I would love to actually, you know what, maybe I'll, maybe at some point I'll, I'll have either, you know, Howie or Will or somebody, maybe I'll see if somebody wants to come on and be a guest on, on the, on the live stream and really talk to them about like, like, what are we dealing with? How many DB are you actually moving things? Like when you're getting decent, not decent, when you're getting like ideal mixes from people, I can't imagine there's more than a couple DB of EQ on any one or two places. Um, if you're sending in shitty mixes, then yeah, it turns into a, it turns into a, like a, a repair job. And I think that's kind of maybe more the point of this particular episode is to really stress, like if you're not happy, like if, if you think you're, you're the mastering is going to be the difference between where you're at and where it needs to be, then you're, the mix isn't done. Um, simple as that. So, um, what are my thoughts on the loudness craziness? Loudness war should be over, but it's not. Well, here's the thing. It's not, it's not just loudness. And I don't even think it's quote unquote loudness anymore. Like, I don't think it's like, it used to be, it used to be quote unquote loudness, right? Like you wanted, when you turned on the radio or you turned on an, a CD or whatever, and then the next song from a different album played. You didn't want to be the guy where the listeners are having to turn up the volume, even though it's as simple as that, right? But we didn't want that to we didn't want that to happen. So in order to get it loud, the dynamic range had to get pulled, like well, had just to minimize, right? And then everything moves up together, and you'll see, like you'll see on this, like you can, you, I mean, it's very very obvious here. Let me get on my uh, Pro Tools page here. Like it's very obvious what's what here, right? Um, these are, this is the mix without a limiter. I add a limiter, which again, talking about changing my mix process, that's something I've implemented. This is my mix. If I had, when I take the limiter off of it, this is the mix that I delivered to mastering. And these are the two 
I got two different options, a digital option and an analog option. And, and Howie and Will always do this, and I fucking love it. It's so cool that they do this. You don't have to ask for it. They just give you an, they give you two options. And sometimes the options are really hard to tell the difference between them. And sometimes and sometimes it's it's very easy to tell the difference. And um, again, we're talking subtleties here. Either one would either like either one would be fine, but they're just giving you two different flavors. Um, but what I think's happened is is the loudness wars. It's not really a loudness thing anymore. Now it's just a dynamic range thing. I think we've gotten so used to squashed mixes because of the loudness thing. Now we don't actually need to make shit that loud. And especially when we're talking about like Atmos and stuff like that, where you're actually limited by what you can pump out. Now we're just talking about dynamic range. And I think people like the sound or have gotten used to the sound of a really squashed mix. And so, like I said, this might, this file up here, if I delivered something to mastering or even to a client to approve 10 years ago, this is this might be what I would have sent them. Now, I you can see the snare transients pop, popping up in this in this file. The reason they're so drastic is because like 3 quarters through my mix I put the limiter on and then I start mixing into it. So, I had to turn up I had to turn up the snare because it's getting yanked down by the limiter. So, that's why when I just turn it off, the snare's loud. If I had if I hadn't have turned a, a limiter on 3 quarters of the way through the mix, uh, I probably wouldn't have turned the snare that loud and it wouldn't have been that transient to begin with. So it's not quite, you know, apples to apples here. But um, so ultimately, I think I think people have just gotten used to the sound and they like the sound. And even sometimes like I I don't necessarily love like like I, I, I like um, I like mixes that breathe a little bit. I like having things quiet so that way the loud things actually sound loud when everything is just at the same level there is no quiet there is no loud it's there's just there is there's some yoda shit for you there is no quiet there is no loud there just is <laughs> uh, if something if you want something to sound loud there needs to be something quiet next to it in order to make it come appear as loud um, same thing with like wide and narrow, right? If you want something to sound wide, well, you need something to sound. There needs to be the opposite in order for there to be, you know, the what the, the intent, right? What do they say with with, with uh, what's the saying about the darkness and the light? Without without uh, without darkness, there can't be light, or the vice versa, whatever. So, anyways, um, so I like I personally like a little bit more dynamics. And so I would say my trend with mastering engineers is typically, yeah, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's just open it up a little bit. Let's not crush it quite so much. Um, that seems to be my biggest feedback lately. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, I think, I don't think it's, it's a matter of, of, of actual like overall volume. It's just, the, it's just the sound now. Um, Favorite best masters I've received are the ones where I almost noticed nothing different. Uh, yeah, Joe, totally, totally. And and what we're gonna listen to today, I guarantee, especially if you guys have headphones on, you'll hear. Or if you've got, if you're listening in monitors, you'll hear difference. But if I played one for you now, and then I explained something and gave you guys like an ear break of even thirty seconds, and then I played another one, you wouldn't be able to tell me which one was which. Guaranteed. I've done this test before with people. Um, when you AB, you absolutely can. But the point of the matter is, and this is again, what kind of my ethos when it comes to mixing. I'm not comfortable uploading a mix to a mastering engineer that I wouldn't feel comfortable uploading that exact same mix to Spotify with just some additional level. That's it. If I'm not comfortable send, uploading it to Spotify tomorrow, as is, my final mix with just a little bit of level, so that way it's at least not quiet, I'm not comfortable, it's not ready to be sent to master. So, if that's my ethos, I shouldn't, I shouldn't want the mastering engineer to change a bunch of stuff. If I wanted it, I would have done it, right? I've got the same, not the same tools, but I've got a, a mastering EQ that I can put on. I'm the master bus. 
I've got limiters I can put on. If I want, if I wanted a certain way, I would do it. So then that kind of again comes back to well, what it, what exactly is mastering? And here is where we'll get into what the mastering guys can do. That it's just not my expertise, and I don't know how to do it. And with also with the quality control. And when I say it, I'm talking about we're, we're going kind of to the loudness thing. I don't I don't know how to get it as loud as it needs to be. And I don't know how to get the dynamic range to where it's competitive to everything else, but it still sounds the way I want it to sound. And that is the magic. The magic of a mastering engineer is making, taking your mix, doing what they need to do to get it loud and competitive and and uh, cohesive, but not chain, but not doing so much or doing it in a way. That's going to make me be like, hmm, this sounds different from the mix I sent you. So anyways, we'll dig into that in a second here. Um, nothing more deflating when the artist goes, I dig the mix, but I bet the master is going to be really taking over the top and bring it together. Yeah, that's, again, and that's, and that's kind of the point of today. That's the point of today. Like, obviously, I've got a small YouTube following here. I would love nothing more for then like for this to go viral and every single person in the music industry, music production industry be like, oh shit, we have to stop thinking that way. I would love nothing more than that to happen because that's that conversation, that thought process should not be happening. So we as mixers also need to educate our client. And, and like I said, one of the things it makes our job harder, but one of the things I like to say to artists, if that comes up, and I'm talking about the comment that Jordan just mentioned about like a, a client or an artist being like, oh man, the mix sounds great. Man, I, once it's mastered, it's going to be even better. The thing that we need to do as mixers or producers with the artist or a label or whomever is we need to, we need to set that expectation right out of the gate. We need to say, well, what would you do? If, like, what, what, is, what, what do you mean it's going to be even better? What would you do to make it better? And like have that conversation, dig in, be like, do you think do you think we need more top? Do you think the bottom end's too big? Do you do you not think it's it's compressed enough? Do you think it's too compressed? Uh, like what 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 in the perfect world? What would you get back from mastering that now you're like really stoked? And if they can't tell you, then you probably like it, your your mix is probably good to go. But if they can say, yeah, no, it sounds great. I just, you know, I think the vocals come, you know, the vocals kind of poking out in a few spots here and there. I think, you know, I think mastering is going to rein that in. I think, you know, we need to add some sheen on the top end and, and stuff like that. I wouldn't be afraid if any of those things sound like big, heavy lifting items. I would not at that point hesitate even for a second to say, well, you know what? Why don't I go take care of that in, in the mix for and just like see if I can if I can solve some of those problems before we send it to mastering. Now. As you get more experienced and as you get go through the process with a really good mastering engineer, like a couple times, you'll realize like that, and I just said sheen on the top end, that's something I do leave to the mastering engineer. But they're not adding so much that I'm like, oh, my mix is dark. No, my mix is the way I want to hear it. And like I said, I would be okay uploading it to Spotify. But if they add just kind of that little bit of top end air to it, or if it needs it, if sometimes it doesn't, but... That's something that I'm not afraid. Like, yes, do your like do your thing with that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a weird thing to deal with. So, what is the deal with dithering in the modern era? Do we dither when balance? Okay, the te technical stuff. Let's let's do like the really technical stuff at the end. So so uh, yeah, let's save that. Let's save the dither question to the very end. Um, I'm trying to be tired of doing. It's considered to be a solid mix. <laughs> Band hires a mastering engineer and they get all the credit for their five percent. Well. Uh, credit, credits, recognition, and all that other fun stuff that we uh, seem to be lacking these days. We're going to do a whole other episode on that because that is a whole other fucking shit show in our business. Um, so yeah. Um, bah, bah, bah. any more questions here? It has to be balances where mixes aren't so crushed. I still like listening to vinyl because there was that limitation. The mixes had to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like everybody's, everybody has their own feeling on that. Uh, but it's definitely become a sound. It's, and I'm not saying it's a bad sound. Like I, but it's become a sound, and it's almost like even when there's not a, a ton of tracks, the compression just just 
pushes everything together to make it sound so dense that anything that's not that way. And when I'm, I'm, I'm talking mainly rock music, that's what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm talking rock music, rock and metal, but like the, the, it's become so dense that anything that's not super dense like that somehow just doesn't come across as being powerful or exciting. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit strange. So, uh, Jeff, yes, down for that episode. Yeah, actually, you might have to be my my guest on that episode because I think we could probably uh, pontificate on the lack of credits and rec and rec recognition. Um, I think we probably have spent a couple hours talking about that already. So, um, Danny, mix as if there won't be mastering. Man, that's a great summary. What a great summary. Mix as if there won't be a master. Um, I love that. I really, really love that. I mean, that might be the most concise, concise way of summarizing kind of my ethos on that. So thank you very much for that. Summer's relying on limiting to get the finished sound. One would be comfortable with uploading Spotify. Is it ready? If somebody was relying on limiting to get the finished sound, one would be comfortable with uploading Spotify. Is it ready for mastering? I would say so. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, if you're, if you're, like I said, if you're ready to like, you're like, cool, this is ready to go, regardless of how you got there. Um, why not? Okay. Last one here. Attitude of mastering became <laughs> the attitude of the mastering being a game changer. <laughs> I need a buzzer every time the word, you know what we should do in post somebody, somebody has to help me out here. I want to put a like a beep over every game changer, uh, mind bending, and um, and there's one other one that I just like vomit in my mouth every time I hear. Uh, there's one other one, but we should uh, we should go through and edit all any video where I say game changing, uh, mind bending, or um, ah fuck, there's another one. <laughs> Groundbreaking. There you go. Groundbreaking revolutionary yeah that one too that one too revolutionary but you know at some point we're gonna run out of fucking words <laughs> all right let's dig in here let's play some audio because uh I'm, i've been staring at this screen i know you guys have and you're probably wondering like what the hell am i looking at here so okay i'm gonna play a little bit here and i want to make sure that it's coming to you guys not distorted and so i'm gonna play a little section here like I said, this is a song I mixed from a, a client. This is the first song I've ever mixed for them. This is an instrumental. I um, was really happy with the mix. Client was happy with the mix. And we uh, sent it to, like I said, Howie Weinberg, an absolute legend in the business. And that you don't have to beep because he is an absolute legend and does great work. And uh, and Will, who works with him, is, is an equally awesome uh, mastering engineer. So um, here we go. You can program your stream deck as a soundboard. Oh, I, sh I should totally do that. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Tom, 10 minutes on M almost any YouTube channel would result in alcohol. <laughs> oh, God, no kidding. No kidding. Oh, man, man. I w Let's just say this. I don't want to talk shit. I don't want to become that guy. But there was a plug-in released this week, well, like three days ago. A reverb plugin by your favorite uh, three or two letter initial company that makes hardware accelerators that nobody actually uses anymore and blah, 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 blah. Anyways, holy shit. Was there just an absolute, uh, uh, Danny, I'm not saying exactly who it is. You can, you can think of who it is, but did they all, did all the YouTubers get the same script? Did that come with their check? <laughs> Here's the bank transfer and PayPal and your script. Holy shit. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> Don't get me started. All right, here we go. I'm going to play this. I'm just going to play a section of the song, and I want you guys to just give me... That's right, Jeff. Uh, give me a, a, a thumbs up if the audio is coming in crystal clear, because I think this is actually the first time I've ever played audio on the channel. We're five episodes in, and I've never actually played a single piece of music. Can you fucking believe that? Here we go. Okay, how are we doing? Is that sounding clear to everybody? Okay, 
Awesome. Level sound great here. Not distorted. Love it all. Cool. So I've got a couple different things that we're looking at here, and I'll, I'll try to be as concise as I can. This mix right here, it's the second one down. This is the mix that I sent to... Uh, this was the final mix. This is the final mix that that went to Howie. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to actually just quickly A-B these for you so you can hear them. So let's just go to the chorus. I'm gonna go to the chorus here. What? Oh, here's the thing. This is what I wanted to explain. You guys have probably seen here. I've got some gain, uh, some clip gain going on that you're probably wondering, like, what's going on here? Okay, so I'm, I, I am I'm going to do my best to not... Uh, to be as objective as possible and to try to match levels and not distort shit and not make stuff sound shitty on purpose to make the other thing sound better to prove my point. I'm going to be as objective and as critically, critical thinking as I can. Critically thinking? Whatever. Um, and so in order to, if you'll see, look at these transients, these huge transients up here. What is Pro Tools doing? Wow, that's an odd graphics bug. Um, in order to get these uh, these transients not to peak, I had to bring, and, and also to, to kind of loudness match, I had to bring all of the masters down so far so that way I could turn this up loud enough to match the perceived volume uh, so when we're a being, So it's crazy because like you look at this waveform and you're like, oh, that's not very big. And you look at this, and you're like, wow, yeah, that's got some really loud stuff in it. Um, these, th the perceived volume in these is almost the same. And that is kind of what I'm talking about, what like a really great mastering engineer can do. These sound, like these mixes kind of all sound similar-ish. Um, this one has, is, the perceived volume is so much louder, but yet the mix doesn't get destroyed. So anyways, um, this is what went to mastering. Just so you guys can hear, because this is the thing that really changed. This has been a big change that I've implemented over the last couple of years. Is I've been mixing, like I said, 75% of the way into the mix, I turn on a limiter. So in this case, this was the limiter that I used. And the, I, I think this is actually the same settings. So I mixed 75% of this song. I turned on this limiter. I turned it on so it was almost, well, I like to call it pseudo mastering. But it was basically giving me an idea of what maybe a, a mastering uh, a process would be, right? If all of it was was just doing level. So then I turn this on, and then I keep mixing. And now I'm making decisions based off the limiter clamping down on, on peaks, right? So what I did today is I actually went back and printed a mix. I just took the limiter off. Again, we're not talking apples to apples because that's not what the final mix would have sounded like if I wasn't mixing into the the limiter, but I wanted to have that available for you guys to hear anyway. So let's just, uh, let's bounce around on this chorus for a second here. So uh, hopefully you guys can see this. This is the mix, no limiter. This is the mix. This is uh, HW's Howie Weinberg Analog, Howie Weinberg Digital. I've gained everything down so that way I could loudness match the best I can without distorting anything, okay? So that's what we're dealing with. So if you see level adjustments, you're not like, oh, he's trying to pull a fast one on us by, you know, fucking us over with the level like everybody else does on YouTube. <clears throat> I mean, uh, everybody's super, super objective and critical on, on YouTube, right? Um, all right, here we go. <laughs> okay, here's the mix. Uh, here's the mix that I sent to Howie. Okay, here's the mix without the limiter. Okay, here's Howie's analog version. Actually, you know what? I'll go digital first. Here's Howie's uh, digital master of the mix that I sent him. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, here's the analog version. Mastered. Okay, those are all relatively level matched, okay? I, I heard a little bit of a discrepancy, but they're within 0.2 or 0.3 dB of kind of like perceived volume. Aside from the snares that were just jumping out like crazy on the non-limited version, I'm actually happy with any of those going, being released tomorrow. Now, there is a clear winner for me, and I don't know if you guys could tell the difference, um, how how like the subtle the differences were but what really blows my mind is like i said i've got a like a, a 17 db level difference well it's that's not exactly fair to say that because i took the limiter off so but there's a good like like 10 db level difference between the unlimited version and one of howie's masters yet Sonically, other than the, the the transient of that snare just like really being like almost obnoxiously uh, pointy, um, like sonically, the, they're comparable. And so the cool thing is, and this isn't this isn't me patting myself on the back of how good of a mix I did. This is actually like this is what a great mastering job should be. It shouldn't be like, holy shit, it sounds so different. It should be like wow, it kind of sounds exactly the way that I gave it to him with a few little extra polishes here and there, but the level is where it needs to be. The dynamic range is where it needs to be. There's no, there's no bullshit popping out. There's no, um, there's no sections of the song that are really quiet, and then when the, when the big part comes in, it's overpowering, or vice versa. When the chorus kicks in, all of a sudden now all the dynamics are gone and, and it doesn't have this, this lift. Like this mix to me still has this lift when the chorus kicks in, yet you look at the waveform and it's like, you're like, how, how, how is that happening? That's the mass. That's the magic to me of a great mastering engineer. It's not that it sounds drastically different. It's just, it now it's going to translate. So now when you're playing this at a low volume through a tiny little speaker, it's actually going to translate. This mix up here, through a big system or in a studio, it's going to sound great. That's not going to sound great coming out of a, of, of a laptop. You're going to hear probably shh and the snare. Doop, doop, doop. That's it. You know, if it's low. And then when you turn it up, that snare is going to be distorting the, the, the speakers. So Jordan says, Howie's masters just sound like more, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. But it's not drastic. Like it's not like if it's not like if you hadn't have heard if you hadn't have heard this in comparison, I don't think it would be. I don't think it would be so drastic that you would be like, oh no, yeah, yeah, we you know, we really gotta use, go with the other one. So, um, one of the things I did want to actually just play really quickly is I just I actually wanted to play the verse into the chorus so you guys could hear that. So. Uh, let's leave an Howie's analog here on for a second. We'll go have it. So to me, obviously, it's, I mean, it doesn't jump. It's not supposed to jump like, 4 dB, but like it still has impact on the chorus, which is what it should. It's not supposed to just be the same the whole way through. So even though it looks kind of the same the whole way through, like it's not, it's the perception of how it's coming through. Um, so anyways, yeah, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm actually going to switch and I'm hoping you guys can see the mute buttons over here. Actually, you know what? Let me do this. Let me get rid of some unneeded stuff over here. All right, I'm going to, um, I'm going to actually just go through and switch a couple times while it's playing so you guys can hear it like without me stopping and starting. So just watch the mute buttons 
you'll see the uh, the audio change, or you'll hear the audio changing when the and the and the mute button's changing, so you can hear it in context here. So let's do this one more time. Cool. Hopefully you guys could really hear it that time. So when I was switching like that last pass, I was switching like almost every two beats. Um, it was probably, it was probably a lot more obvious there. Um, the low end extend with the analog is nice. Okay. So that was going to be my next question. I want everybody to chime in on like what, what number one, what did they like the best? And number two, what did you notice as the difference and I'll, and I'll kind of give you guys a couple of minutes to kind of just chime in there because I'm curious to see how everybody interprets this. Right. Um, again, mastering shouldn't be doing a ton, but, but there is a little bit of a subjective nature to like, well, what do you want? I know some people who I mix for the way that I mix and my tendencies and my kind of the way I hear stuff when they send it out to mastering, if something is going to happen, if they're like, I love everything and we're good, but if we could just get it a little bit this, then great. And it's just a bonus. It's like icing on the cake. For one guy in particular, I know his preference and I've started to just kind of maybe just tailor my mixes a little bit more this way to their stylistic preference. Um, they prefer it that it be just a little bit less transient and, uh, a little more, a little less, like not bright the top end, but like, like, like five, six, seven K little less. I know other guys that I mix for when they send it out, they want the bottom end kind of shaved off a little bit and they want a little bit of like air, like 20 K stuff. And I know 20 K is like dog hearing, but when you do 20 K on a EQ, um, it actually usually is, is very perceivable especially on a lot of these mastering things. So, okay, going to the, going to the chat, going to the comments here. Um, Reynold, uh, low end extended with the analog is really nice. We feel it moving. Uh, Joe Cross, uh, uh, hardware analog, both his masters just seem to add a nice sheen and balance on your mix. For me, analog wins, symbols, top end. I, pre I don't prefer with the digital. It's hard for me to articulate, but the analog just sounded the most right, I guess. But it's so subtle, it might be biased because I see the word analog. <laughs> analog sounds the most even and pleasing. Digital has something in the highs that isn't my favorite. Analog was nice, smoother, and nice sheen. Unanimous. And that was my favorite. So when I got these back from Howie, right out of the gate, I'm like, wow. Okay, we're going to get, get on to the next really big benefit of mastering. And to me, this is the biggest benefit, okay? When I heard Howie's back, when I heard the analog and the way that, uh, that there is, there is kind of like a fat bottom end and here, I, I, let me, let me, let me clarify one other thing here. Cause I know, I, I know when they do these masters, I know what they're like, I, I, like, I know the process a little bit cause I've sat in with them while they're doing it. Okay. This isn't. We've got an analog pull tech set to this, and then we're going to put on the digital pull tech and set it to this and see which one's better. They're not doing that. They don't give a fuck. One of them is just what they're like, oh, if we go all analog, what is this going to sound? Oh, not all analog, but if we go, if we implement analog, what is this going to sound like? And they just do it to what they think is going to sound good. And then almost as if 
they hadn't uh, they hadn't done that at all, then they leave it in the box and they do a digital version. It's not supposed to be the same thing, one analog, one digital. So the thing I don't want you guys to take from this is like, see, I told you analog sounds better. Because I'll tell you right now, the last three things I've had in Howie Master, the digital is one. So it's less about analog versus digital and it's more about A, B or CD or whatever you want to call it. Don't, don't think of this as analog versus digital. Think of this as option one and option two. That's it. How they got there is almost irrelevant. The, the reason the bottom end is warmer and smoother, it's not because it's analog. It's because of what they did with analog. Okay? If that makes sense. Hopefully you guys get that. I just realized, I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to send you guys down some weird fucking rabbit holes if I don't clarify that. Please do not take that. This is not analog versus digital. That's not what this is. And I kick myself for even just putting that out there. I should have put one and two. Anyways. I like the analog better. When I heard it back and I heard what the bottom end was doing and the way that it was warm and what he was doing with with like the top end, I was uh, the, my immediate immediate thought was like I wish I just would have done that. And it's not it's subtle, but a lot of a lot of this stuff is subtle. But I thought I'm like fuck that that's a cool take. And here is probably the biggest reason why I like sending my mixes out to like A list mastering guys. They are hearing the song for the first time. They have no connection to the artist. They didn't weren't in the studio making the thing. They don't, they, they don't care. They are so disconnected from anything other than the sound. They have no option to play with the vocal. They have no option to play with the kick. All they're listening to is like super objective, like, thousand mile view although they're listening for like details from an overall treatment standpoint it's so big picture they don't care they can't they can't eq the kick drum by 0.6 db like we can when we're mixing and they don't care and they don't care if it was recorded on a console or mixed in the box or used a c12 or a fucking sm5 they don't care so the objectivity of a mastering engineer who's hearing this song for the first time, mass does, does what they think it needs and has the thing done in a half hour or an hour, the objectivity, just another unbiased, unfiltered, untarnished opinion is worth the price of mastering alone. Even if all they say is, sounds awesome, I wouldn't do a thing. That is worth it to me to have a really great mastering engineer deal with my, my mixes. And so if you don't get anything else from this video today, because I know you guys are going to take the analog versus digital, like up the flagpole on online. I know that. I know that I'm going to have to come and hunt you guys down. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Like just having somebody objectively listening is like somebody who knows, who knows what to listen for, who knows what they're doing. I'm mean, like, yeah, I get on my wife listen, but like, and she can be like, yeah, it sounds good. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who really knows what they're doing. And also if you hand it to another mix engineer and be like, hey, what do you think? It's different. They're going to be thinking about it from levels and, and uh, levels and panning and treatments, like, like micro treatments, right? That's not what you're looking for. The mastering guys know they can't change any of that. So they come at it from a different angle. Okay, so that's probably the most important thing. And I would hope, and again, like, you know, if, if, if there are any mastering engineers or aspiring master, mastering engineers who are, who are in the chat or watching right now or even are watching later, if there's something that I would like to try to perpetuate in the mastering business is if you get a shitty mix, as much as I know we all want to, like, we're all trying to make a living and it's like, yeah, you know what, I need the business, whatever, um, if you get a shitty mix, I would love the, uh, as a mixer, I would love the opportunity, if somebody is listening objectively, I would love the opportunity to fix something that might be really easy to fix, that maybe I just was so zoomed in on something else, or maybe I was so burnt out, or maybe who knows what, or maybe my listening environment wasn't as good as theirs. I would love the opportunity to fix something before getting a master back and then them being like, well, sorry, man, this is all I could do. Your, your mix kind of sucked. So 
obviously it's like, yeah, if you get a mix and you're like, dude, I got like 40 notes, like I, there's no way. I mean, that's a different story, but you know, I've had, I've had scenarios where it's been very obvious that we're like, like, oh man, fuck the, like, it was very obvious that the snare just got demolished in mastering, like just in order to get the level up, the snare's getting killed, which is why I started adding the limiter. That's why I started adding the limiter. I was, I started to anticipate mastering so much because mastering the level, the level, like I said, it's not loudness wars, but just like the dynamic range, kind of acceptable dynamic range these days in, in heavy rock music has gotten kind of so small. What was happening was I was sending out mixes where I'm like, this sounds great. And then they were doing all their tricks. And then the snare sounded like 3 dB too low. And as you guys know, I love a loud snare, so that's not acceptable. So, so what I started doing was um, I started anticipating mastering. This used to be my old workflow. I would anticipate mastering. I would get the mix to where I was happy. I would usually turn up the snare like two or three dB, depending on how dense the track already was. I would put a limiter on it to rein in that snare, send that to the client to get the mix approved. And then once the mix got approved, when I printed my mix, I wouldn't put the limiter on it. And then I would send the non-limited version to the mastering engineer and then they would do their thing. And then the snare would get yanked down. Like I knew it probably would, but still it was a little bit of a moving target. So what I started doing is I like said, fuck it. I'm going to put the mat. I'm going to rein in the snare drum, the transient of the snare. Sometimes it's a kick, but it's usually the snare with my mixes. It's usually the snare. That's too fucking loud. I'm going to rein in the snare before I send it to mastering. I'm not going to let the mastering engineer, not let, that's not a bad, that's, that, that's like, that, that's not the right way to say it. I'm not going to rely. I'm not going to rely on the mastering engineer to rein in my snare that's too transient. I'm just going to take care of it. And that's why I started putting the limiter on at the end, like 75% through the mix. Okay. Um, I was on another train of thought and I kind of lost it, but I'm going to go back to the chat here for a second. Uh, do, 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 do. Analog sounds most even pleasing. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think we all, yeah. So we all agreed like, like the analog sounded good, but it wasn't, it's not because it was analog. It's because of what they did with their analog gear. Right. <laughs> so, um, Tom asks, does an A-list mastering engineer give you feedback if you could be doing something better in the mix? Oh, dude, I, sorry, I didn't even see that. Um, not enough, to be honest with you, not enough. But that's kind of not their job. Like, And that's why I'm like, I'd like to try, like, I mean, mix engineers, <laughs> not to turn this into like a wah, you know, bitch session for mix engineers. Mastering guys have it so easy. They don't. But... Mix engineers have had to start doing so many things that are like, that's not mixing. Like, that's not that's not my job, but we do it anyways because we want the project to be great. I don't think it's the mastering engineer's job to, like, give mix critiques. I kind of don't. But I think if there's something glaringly obvious or if there's something that it's a very quick and easy change that's not going to open a can of worms, especially if you have a good relationship with the mixers, like if you're a mastering engineer or if you're a mastering engineer, the mixer, you know, you, the mixer has a good relationship with you. I I would like for that to be more of a common occurrence. I wouldn't take that as an insult. If if Howie had like with this mix, if Howie had sent me an email being, "Hey Chris, I put the track up. It sounds fucking awesome." I think there's just a little too much X, Y, Z. Will you print me an option? Do you think, do you think the client would, would mind, mind, would mind terribly if you printed me an option with like just a, two slight adjustments and I'll run both of them through for you. Like that wouldn't take anybody, like that would take me like five, 10 minutes to do. They'd probably take the mastering engineer another like five minutes, 10 minutes at the most. And that could be the difference between something that's kind of like, yeah, that's like a nine and a half. Versus like, oh, fuck, that's a 10, right? Or maybe it means the mastering guy doesn't have to like compromise because everything's a, everything that we do is a compromise. All of these problems that we have to solve when we're mixing and producing and mastering and all, everything's a compromise. And that, that's the other thing. I, I, I'm, I'm always trying to not be condescending, but I'm always trying to educate, you know, hey, can we turn up the vocal? Sure, but just so you know, 
if we turn up the vocal, now the guitars aren't going to seem as loud, or now the snare's not going to seem as loud, or whatever, right? Oh, can we turn up the, the rhythm guitars? I want, like, can we turn those up like 4 dB? Sure, but now we're going to bury your vocal. Like, everything's a trade-off. So when the mastering guys are, are working on a mix, if they're like, ah, oh, fuck, I really got to rein in that snare, that snare's just fucking, like, really transient. I got I to gotta rein that in. That's not only affecting the snare. Like, other things are getting sacrificed in order to make that move. So if there's a scenario where a mastering engineer calls the mix engineer and says, hey, here's what I'm thinking. Any chance you could like just saturate the shit out of the snare or like use a clipper on the snare or even you just limit the snare only and get it sitting where the perceived volume is what you want, but we're just chopping off all those transients that are just sticking up like crazy. I don't know. Maybe then when the mastering guy doesn't have to do that, maybe then it doesn't sacrifice something else that would have been sacrificed if, if, if it would have been done on the whole two track. Right? So there's all these like trade-offs. So I, I, I would like to, like I said, I would like to perpetuate, uh, or at least kind of open the conversation a little bit more between and, uh, uh, mastering guys and mix guys, but I get it. It creates more work, right? It takes more time turn around, like, I, I, I get it, right? And also, you change one little thing, and then the clients, you, like, you got to get client approval, and then if the master comes back, they're like, oh, I fucking hate this. What happened? And if the mix engineer went and changed three things, like, I get it. I get it. It's got to be the right scenario. It's got to be the right relationship, and it can't be for every little thing. It's not like, hey, you got to, you know, you got to go in and, and ride the Tom fills. It's like, no, that's not the mastering engineer's job to tell you that. You should know that. But if the mastering engineer is going to make a move that's going to sacrifice something, then maybe that's a conversation that could happen, right? So back to the chat. Uh, loud snare gang. Oh, yeah. Um, Tom Baker did some mastering for me a few years back. I love Tom. I used to use Tom all the time uh, when I was in L.A. Um, I, I've, I, I haven't used, I haven't, he hasn't mastered something for me in a while, but I really, really liked his work. I, I should actually send something to him sometime soon. Uh, he gave me some feedback that was very appreciated. And I think that helped the end product. I love hearing that. And Tom's that, like, Tom's that kind of guy. Like, he will absolutely, in a nice way, be like, yeah, you know what? The vocal is a little too sibilant. He's like, um, can you run, like, he's like, if you'd be open to it, run a version. Run a version with, like, you know, go in and carve out some of those S's for me. So, uh, have I tried AI or software mastering? I tried, I can't remember what was like the first one, like probably five years ago. Was it Lander? I haven't tried it lately. Um, I do have a couple of, uh, credits for the waves, for the waves version that I'm, I'm very interested in trying. Um, maybe I'll run this through it. Maybe we should do that right now. <laughs> I'm not going to make you guys uh, watch while I learn how to use a fucking AI mastering plugin. But I mean, I'd be interested to run it, th run it through here just to see. Um, be very interesting. Like I, I feel like, like the AI tools, they're getting really fucking good. And again, when we're talking about, you know, if we get to a point where, if we get to a point where we're, the mix is, good enough to release and all all that needs to happen is level and there's a tool that can follow that kind of instruction be like listen don't like just minimal moves just to optimize level like that, that could be that could be kind of a cool a cool scenario um but again the thing that for me is 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 where the value of a mastering engineer is is in like the objective third party with I don't want to say no skin in the game, but they don't they don't know the argument that happened over the sound of the snare drum between the drummer and the guitar player and the mixer and the producer. Like they don't care. They're like, yeah, the snare drum sounds a little weird. So and not that they they can fix that, but like they're going to be objective, right? And they they haven't been beaten to death by hearing the song on loop for four hundred fifty seven thousand times while recording you know guitar solos. So. Um, that for me is like where the value is. And obviously, I mean, I guess AI is ob objective, but it's kind of like, it, it, I think it's going to take, it's going to take probably a lot of like, it's probably going to take like just multiple scenarios of like, 
that was awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome to me to, ha to for me to be like, okay, maybe there's something there. The minute something starts going like, eh, it's all right. Or eh, like, there's too much going on there. Or they kind of fucked up my snare drum or they squashed the piss out of the, like now the vocal sounds harsh or now the, you know, the guitars are too scooped and like it, and that's what I remember with, I think it was, I think it was Lander. Maybe it wasn't. There was another, like one of the first AI ones, uh, online ones. It just, I, I tried it like three or four times. And every time it was like, it was like they wanted, it was like all of their models were based off of shitty mixes. So it's like, oh, we have to add 7 dB of 60 Hertz to everything. And it's like, no, I, I build that into my mixes. If anything, I probably need a few dB less of 60 Hertz. <laughs> so anyways, um, Going back, going back, anal OG. <laughs> uh, have you tried AI or software? Have you sent a mix back for them to fix before mastering or got? Have you? Have I ever? Oh, what's going on here? OBS is sending me a message. No, oh, I think we might have just dropped out for a second. We're good. Thanks, Mike. Um, Jay, I think you're asking, have I sent a mix to mastering to fix something before them sending something back? Yeah. On the last Nickelback album, I, Ted Jensen, uh, mastered it. He probably was about to fucking kill me. Um, I was, I, I sent him on, there was probably two or three songs that I, I, I think like I'd, I sent him what I thought was the final mix and I'm like, this sounds fucking awesome. And then he mastered it. And just even the break, I think there was like a two or three week period between like when I got the masters back um, and I was listening critically again. And I was like, oh man, I started hearing all of these things. So I went and changed a bunch of things in the mix, uh, sent it back to Ted, been like, you don't have to change anything. You keep doing what you're doing. Like just, just run it through the chain again. But I made a bunch of moves based off of that. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I try not to do that because it creates a lot of extra work, but that happens. You hear, you get the mastering back and you hear what it does and you're like, okay, cool. I'm going to make a couple moves. Don't change anything. I mean, I'm now hearing it through the lens of the mastering and I'm just going to make a couple moves. So that way, when the new mix goes through that same chain, I fix some of the things that the mastering may have had to sacrifice too much. So hopefully that answered your question. I wasn't sure if that was actually the question or not, but do I have... Uh, do you have send stems to mastering? I do not send stems to mastering. Um, I do not want uh, the level of my drums versus the level of my bass versus the level of the guitar versus the level of the vocals. All of that is is built into the mix. No. <laughs> Thanks, David. I, I, see your, I see your edits here. Do you use clippers to control snare? Yep, absolutely. Um, use anything. Like, it, it depends. Like, sometimes... Sometimes literally all I want to do is chop off the top of the snare. Sometimes I want to um, saturate the top of the snare. So it's like, I still want it to be loud. I still want it to be transient. Um, but, you know, maybe just adding a little bit of distortion will give it that perception, but will also soften it in a way. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. And that's where mixing becomes like super fun, right? Is like, okay, I got, I've got problem X. And I have 45 different ways to fix it. Um, but every one of those ways is going to change something else about it. So you got to pick the one that you're like, cool. When it something else about it changes because I did this thing to it, how can I optimize all those other things at the same time? And that's that's where the problem solving comes in. So I uh, wish more projects had a budget for him. Tom rocks. Yeah, no, I, I mean, and that's unfortunately like, you know, uh, I've I've got on my list of live stream topics. I am going to do a live stream topic that's going to be a little bit more like businessy and like, you know, doing budgets and like how to allocate budgets and what's, you know, what percentage of your budget can be can be put into certain things and and where where is your money best spent? And unfortunately, um there isn't really like a consensus on that. Um, I think because everybody's experiences are, are so different, but I know some people who get to the mastering process and they're not willing to spend anything. They're like, fuck that. They're like, no, nah, sounds good. Just normalize it, put a limiter on it and let's, let's put it out. 
And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you, you got to understand like this is, it, there's more to it than that. Um, but they just, they, they, the incremental improvement they they don't want to spend money on. Um, I mean, I, I, I think the same goes for, I think a lot of like tracking engineers, right? I think a lot of everybody thinks they can track. So nobody spends money on tracking engineers anymore. That used to be a job. There used to be guys who all they did was record. That job like doesn't exist anymore. Those guys have either had to start mixing or have become producers. And ultimately like that, maybe in Nashville that still exists for like the, you know, live off the floor sessions with seven guys and, you know, all playing live and they got to cut a whole album in three hours. Yeah. You want to make sure you got a, a, a tracking engineer who knows what they're doing. Um, but yeah, like a lot of people are like, yeah, you know what, let's save that money. Let's put that towards mixing or let's put that towards touring or let's put that be towards, you know, Facebook ads or whatever they think their marketing plan is. Right. So, um, it's an interesting conversation to have of like, okay, yeah. Is it worth, I mean, mastering, but mastering fees are, 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 are drastically different. Right. So sometimes it's hard to convince somebody that, you know, spending an extra couple hundred bucks a song with an A-list guy versus maybe an AI option. Sometimes that, sometimes that's, you can't like, that's, that's, I mean, it's, it's a valid argument sometimes, right? Depending on the cost, but yeah, it's kind of a whole other topic in a sense. Isn't Isotope an AI mastering plugin? Yeah. Ozone. Ozone definitely has like an AI component where it will listen to the music and suggest settings. And um, honestly, I've used that a lot. Um, I can't say I've ever left it <laughs> as it is. Like it does a bunch of shit that I'm like, oh, there's some cool stuff in there, but there's a bunch of stuff that's, that's shit. Um, typically when I'm using Ozone and I just want to do like a pseudo mastering job, or maybe even if it's a mix that I'm just like, I'm struggling with and I'm just like, grasping at straws a little bit. Um, sometimes I'll put that on and I'll run it through like the, the AI thing. And then what I'll do is I'll go through each individual, um, uh, module and turn it on and off to hear what it's doing. And I would say most of the time, uh, most of the time I'm like turning half of the modules off and then the modules that I leave on, I'm, I'm adjusting certain things as well. So, um, ba ba ba. They consider ozone to be more machine learning than AI, as far as I've read. Yeah, however they want to, however they want to say it. I feel like an old man shaking my fist at the clouds, but I just need a human listening to the track. <laughs> um, yep, sorry for the buff buffering. Oh, we're all back, all good. Thank you. Uh, do I have a set of monitors or boombox you listen to on before sending the mix out to mastering? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I listen to as much as many different formats as my brain and my ears and my time and my sanity will allow. Um, I mean, I've obviously got my studio monitors. Um, I've got um, like blue, like little Bluetooth speakers. I've got computer speakers. Obviously I've got my laptop speakers. Um, I've got about a thousand types of headphones. I've got all the Apple earbuds, the regular ones, the pros, the big over the ear ones versions one, two, and three. And, um, I listen to my car. I listen to my wife's car. Sometimes what I like to do is I like to put it just on like, uh, like playing on like a Bluetooth sound, uh, like a Bluetooth speaker, but not like sit there and listen to it. I like to like, okay, I'm going to go have breakfast. Um, so part of here, here's a, something that maybe is useful to uh, like, I know probably a lot of us are in the, here are, are coming at this from a mixing angle, but, um, here's just kind of a quick it's not a trick because I think a lot of people do it, but it's maybe some advice. Um, sometimes listening on different devices, I mean, listening on different devices is great, but it's almost more valuable to me instead of switching, sitting where, where I'm at and switching to a different set of speakers. It's almost more valuable to me to just let the mix play through my speakers, but get up and walk around, like go, go to the coffee bar and make myself a coffee while the mix is playing. And it's like, I'm listening, but I'm not really listening. Like I'm kind of listening, but I'm not. And I usually, if I'm going to do that, I usually take a pad of paper with me because as soon as it gets to like more than three or four things, I know I'm going to start forgetting. So I'll just jot some stuff down and I might just let it loop a couple of times while I walk around like the studio or if I walk, walk around like wherever I am, like at, at um, when we're doing the Nickelback albums, Chad's studio is kind of in this like upper level of a 
what used to be a barn, but now it's like a, you know, a house area thing. And right outside the studio is like a lounge and a kitchen and there's a door. And what I like to do is I like to play it really loud, walk out in the kitchen and close the door, but not all the way. So now I'm lis I'm actually listening and making mix notes, listening to the mix through a door. And I know it sounds fucking insane, but I swear to you, while I'm out in the kitchen making a coffee, listening through a closed door, I've actually been able to like solve problems that I was like, fuck, how, like, how, why can't I fix this thing? And the minute I go do that, I'm like, I know what the problem is. And I go back in and I fix it and it's done. Um, so just like figure out what works for you. Sometimes, so for me, I found that like, it's, it's less about the different speaker. I mean, I do listen on a bunch of different speakers, but it's almost less about the speakers and it's more about like where I am and what I'm doing and what, how, how, am I listening to the snare drum? I, a big, a big challenge that we have as mixers is listening to the song, listening to the, the, to the record. And when I say the record, like the, the, the recording of the song, right? Don't listen to the mix, listen to the record. And that's the way that we, <laughs> Mike, sorry. I saw Mike Langford's comment here. <laughs> Game changer. Beep. I should get zapped by a cattle prong in my chair. Um, yeah, it's, it, figure out a way. Everybody's got their own hack, but figure out a way, figure out your hack to force yourself into listening to the mix or not the mix, sorry, listening to the song. Figure out a way to force yourself to listen to the song and not the mix. And like Mike was joking about here, my way of doing that sometimes is like listening through a wall or listening through a closed door or listening over top of the hockey game on the TV or listening um, while a coffee maker is going like whatever the fuck is going on, right? Figure out what works for you. Maybe that's driving around the neighborhood, right? I know a lot of people like the car test. It's great. There's two things I think are great about the car test. Aside from just the sonics of a car, number one, you actually can't change anything while you're there unless you're bringing your iPad in and mixing in your car. And because you can't change anything, you're listening more of just kind of like, okay, cool, I'm just listening. I can't actually go and like dial in the snare right now. Like I'm just listening. Number two, and I don't know if everybody does this, but I usually have the engine on. I usually go for a drive. I'm usually doing something and I'm also out of my element. So it's a little bit of like change of environment, changing of like what your brain is focusing on doing. Like if I'm driving, a portion of my brain is being diverted to making sure I don't fucking drive off a cliff. And so I can't be that like zoned in on like the frequent, the high end frequency on the hi hat, right? Like just, it's not, it's not possible unless, you know, you're, fucking way smarter and way better at uh, multitasking than me. But it, it's it's almost a way to, it, it, you're forcing yourself to zoom out. And if you can figure that out, I would say I'm like maybe 90% there. Like I've figured out a bunch of tricks to do it. But if like, I'm still working on figuring out, like I want to be able to flip that switch and, and completely zoom out and almost zone out. And if I could do that on command, like that would be, I feel like that would be like a mix superpower that I would like fucking love to have. And I've been working on that. So everybody figure out what that is for you. Cause everybody, I think it's different for everybody. So, um, uh, let me go back in the chat here. Sorry guys, keeping up here. Uh, yeah. So I listen on everything, anything and everything. Um, Ba, 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 ba. Yes, thank you, KJ. I'm glad I got your, your question right. Uh, how loud are my mixes compared to masters? Great question. Okay, so this is something... <laughs> this is something I've actually had a couple conversations with, and I still don't get it. Okay, so when I send a mix out to a client, so let's say this one here, um, I'm getting that level up to where, like, there's no... There's not a lot of, like like headroom left, right? I'm not talking about dynamic range, but I'm like, I'm either limiting that thing to like just under zero, or if I've done all my limiting in the, in my mix bus that I'm, you know, normalizing it up or whatever. Um, when I send it to mastering, a lot of the mastering guys, they're like, yeah, you know what? Give me six DB of headroom. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, well, couldn't you just turn my mix down? They're like, yeah, but I don't want to have to do that. And I'm like, but that's all I'm doing. Like most of the time when I'm printing final mixes, 
if my mixes are like peaking at around like let's say just under zero because I've done all my mix bus stuff and I've gotten the level up and I've kind of done a little bit of a, a mixed into a little bit of a pseudo master level master, um, I'm just grabbing the output and turning it down by six dB before printing. So um, the peak level of my mixes are usually minus six when I send them the mastering. But I, to be honest with you, I don't understand why we can't, the mix can't, like the audio file can't just be gained down 6 dB or whatever they want after the fact. I, I'm not sure of that, but it seems like I haven't gotten a really good answer on that. But anyways, um, so yeah, my mixes, my mixes, my mixes are, I mean, they're loud, but they're not, they, they get louder as you can see. I mean, um, Howie's master, I had to turn up my my mix ref, which is like, that's the level that I want, that I sent to him. Um, I had to turn up, well, actually, my mix ref would have been down 6 dB. Okay, so we're 7.5 dB. So How, Howie's, Howie's version was a dB and a half peak louder, but perceived is probably more than that. It's probably like three, four, maybe even five dB louder than than the mixes that I'm sending, or the mixes that I, the, my refs that that the clients are approving. So clear as mud. <laughs> um, mixing is fun. Wait, mixing is fun? No, it's not, Jeff. It should be, but it's not. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, we are all producers now, aren't we? Yep. Um, the Slate VSX headphones. Uh, I have not tried the VSX headphones. No. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone in the walk around. Oh, dude, it's the best. It, it literally, like, that can give me so much perspective and so much, um, like, just, like I said, you. it's almost like so... Uh, it's such a moving target when you're walking around or when you're not paying attention that like you just convince yourself, you're like, ah, fuck it. I can't like, I'm just going to listen to the song. And that's, that's the magic. Like figure out how to trick yourself into just listening to the song. So <laughs> that's right. I thought I was being a, I was a caffeine addict, which is why I was getting up and making coffee all the time instead of uh, yeah, listening to the mix. Yeah, exactly. Um, what's Jay got here? I would listen to my mixes and my headphones, but not have them on, and I would change it accordingly. I'd set them on the counter and just listen. Totally, yeah, yeah. Like that's that's a that's an interesting thing. Sometimes um, I remember where was I? I don't know which studio I was at, but um, the vocal booth. You had to walk through the vocal booth to get out of the control room, just like the way that the studio was was designed. And uh, we had just finished. We had just finished. Um, I was doing rough mixes. Like these weren't album finished mixes because we were still recording. But I remember uh, we were tracking something. Somebody was in the vocal booth and the headphones, they were the Sony headphones, the Sony 7506s. And those ear pads can actually completely flip so that they're, and, and most singers who don't give a fuck about wrecking headphones, just grab the headphones off their head and throw them down. And most of the time those Sonys kind of flip to where the speakers are pointing out instead of in. And I remember walking through the booth, probably to get a coffee, and hearing like hearing the mix. I think people were listening to it in the control room, and it was amazing. I was like, may, I was listening through like just fucking cranked headphones that were sitting on the floor, inside out, and I was actually like making mental mix notes. I mean, they weren't mix notes, but like little like sonic notes. I was like, oh, I gotta go do that. I gotta do that. I gotta do that. And I was like, oh fuck, like that was cool. But I guess you know that's no kind of no different than like just mixing on, or uh, listening on like a really small like computer speaker. It's kind of the same thing. So. I actually, about 15 years ago, it's funny, I should find the pictures. About 15 years ago, um, I got, I think my wife got it from work. Like she was at some event and they, you know, the, when they, you go to some like, you know, corporate event and they have like goodie bags and shit, whatever. And she brought home this, like, it was like, um, it wasn't a name brand, but it was like this little like US, not USB. Uh, yeah, I guess it was USB at that time. But it was like these, it was like a little like, like, computer speaker and it was triangular and it had two little woofers that were about like that big 
Um, and then in the middle, I think it might have had like a little screen that just like was like the clock or maybe the volume level or whatever. And you'd, you'd have to plug a, a, an eighth inch into this thing. Anyways, I started using this thing and like mixing through it. And I was like, fuck, that's really good for certain things. And then I had a set of computer speakers that were like that big. And so then I would switch to that. And I'm like, well, that's good for something else. And then obviously you got your big speakers and all this shit. And I was actually thinking like probably 15 years ago, I mapped it out. I'm like, it'd be really cool to build a box that, you know, maybe would sit up on a meter bridge or it could sit on your desk or somewhere else. And it literally had like six different types of tiny little speakers in it. And you could just like literally flick through them and be like, here's the, what a one inch speaker sounds like. Here's what a two and a quarter inch speaker sounds like. Here's a four and not simulated, like actually have these speakers. And I kind of mapped this out and I was going to get it built and then. I was like, yeah, fuck it. Everybody made a Bluetooth speaker like a year later. And I'm like, yeah, this is no need for this anymore. But anyways, there's my idea. Somebody run with it. Um, I'll buy one. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, can't be bothered to use clip game. I'm a busy man. And <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> and I don't know. Maybe that's all it is. I'm like, why can't you turn the mix down by 6 dB? I don't know. I'm too busy. So, um, Okay, two last questions for you. Uh, using trigger, how do you find... Okay, hang on one second, Jay. I'm going to wrap up the mastering stuff, and then we'll get to, like, we'll get to, you know, full-on open open season Q&A here. Um, is, if there's any more mastering plugin or mastering plugins, if there's any more mastering questions, there's tons of mastering plugins. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of gear tube reviews next week of them. <laughs> um if there's any more mastering questions, definitely let me know. But I just want to kind of kind of do just do a little bit of a quick review of maybe a summary. Number one, I highly suggest figuring out uh, a way to somewhat transparently and somewhat uh, I don't want to say like, you know, subtle because it maybe it doesn't need to be subtle, but, but figure out, play around in your practice time, play around with some tools that almost kind of simulate some of the level stuff that a, a good mastering engineer would do. So if that's sticking, like I said, I, I, I've been using the Weiss digital limiter or sorry, the maximizer, um, find something that you're like, yeah, I can stick that on the back end of my mix and it doesn't change things sonically too much, but it just, it reigns in, like you can see the difference between like these transients and that. Like this is the same mix. All this is doing is just reigning in those transients and then turning everything up a little bit. But once you level match, the only thing that's really happening here is these transients are getting pulled down. But sonically, I'm okay, like, I'm okay with it. Like, and, and once you get used, once you know what it's doing, then you can mix into it. So number one, if you already don't do that, I know everybody, you know, not everybody. Some I know some people say like don't have a bunch of shit on the ma don't have a bunch of shit on the um the mix bus um that you don't need. Don't master, don't like don't be doing the mastering engineer's job for them, all this shit. I, I agreed. But find a tool that you can put on the that you can kind of limit shit down a little bit and not cannibalize the rest of your mix. And for the last like 10 moves, 15, 20 moves that you do have that on um because that i think will help once you go to mastering you're already going to be closer to what that's going to be so there's going to be less changes that are going to be taking place number one um the second thing i i would say is start having conversations with your clients about about the actual uh process of, of what to expect from mastering start setting those expectations early um you can also make if you're a mixer or even a producer for that matter, like you, you can, you can actually bring some value, even added value to the table by saying, let's, if there's anything you're hearing that you're like, oh, we'll get that in mastering. Be like, no, no, let's get it now. Let's, let me, let's, let's, let's dig in. Like, let's, let's fix those things now, or let's try that, or let's add that, or let's, you know, whatever, unless there's a reason not to, but most of the time there's not a good reason not to like fix a mix problem in, in, and I think ultimately in the client's eyes, you're just going to look more valuable to them or you're going to look better at your job. It's not going to be admitting there's something wrong with your mix. You're just trying to help, trying to help uh, uh, push the, the project forward, right? And you're trying to be part of the solution and you're trying to make it as good as it can be before it even goes to the next step, right? 
Also, start having those conversations with your clients about the, the value of an objective third opinion. Not only that, but mastering guys ma can master a whole album in a day. Okay? I can't. Fuck, I'm slow. I'm slow. I, I can barely mix a song in a day. So these mastering guys are hearing so much more music. They, they have their finger on the pulse of what's coming out. They have their finger on the pulse of stylistically where things are going. Is, is, are, you know, is everybody adding a bunch of top end? Are, are mixes too bright? Do they not have enough bottom end? They know what's going on. So even just having that expertise and that last layer of, of quality control is very, very important. I just remembered my thought that I digressed from like 45 minutes ago. There's a quality control aspect to mastering that not a lot of people give uh, a, a credence to that really needs to, to be talked about. And I don't know all the details of what goes on, but there is quality control in terms of clicks and pops and little bits of distortions and um, uh, whether it be little dropouts or little, little buzzes or hums and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff, mas great mastering engineers, just take care of that shit without even letting you know. And then all of a sudden you get it back and you're like, shit's quieter. Shit's like, like not quieter in terms of the song. You're like, no, you can actually turn it up louder now because you got rid of the buzz. And now that if you would have turned it up like that before, the buzz in that guitar would have been a pain in the ass. Like there's all of these things that they're doing from a quality control standpoint that also makes the process very important. And so again, like I've preached on other, uh, uh, on other um, platforms about producers producing, I don't want, if I'm producing a track and sending it to somebody to mix, I want all of their time and energy focused on mixing. So I'm going to make pr production decisions so that way they don't have to. I'm going to make sure the session's cleaned up because I don't want them spending time and energy cleaning up the sessions. I want them spending all of their time, all of their energy, all of their expertise on the thing that's actually what their best job uh, title or skill is. Same thing with mastering, right? I don't want them fixing my mix. I want them doing quality control. I want them f like going through and finding those little tiny things that because they've got these crazy monitoring systems that they can hear that I can't, or they've got tools that can get rid of that shit that I just don't know how to use. That's not, that's not really what I do. And then letting them have this big picture of objectivity and not be so zoom zoomed in the way that we, like we get when we're mixing. That is huge. So like understand that, Let's help educate the rest of the industry with this so that way we understand what's going on and the client's not expecting some magical thing to come back from mastering. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is ultimately, like, have an open, find mastering engineers who instinctively do what you like and who like what you do. Um, you're going to have a really hard time being satisfied with masters. If you're sending, if you mix a certain way and you're sending it to a mastering engineer who just doesn't like that sound because he's going to do everything in his power to make it sound good to him, which might be undoing the thing that sounds good to you. So you got to try out a bunch of people, find the people that you like, find the people that like what you do and, and really build up a relationship and have that open dialogue with them so you can understand what they're doing to your mix. You can sometimes take care of things before it even gets to them. And if they have an issue with something, they can come and talk to you about it and they can get it taken care of so they don't have to compromise something else down the line by fixing that problem. So a um, bit of a summary there. Hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, I'm going to go back to the chat here. I saw a couple questions popping up. Jay, you had a question. Can you show how you do the mid-side widening thing in Pro Tools? I forgot the actual term for it, uh, but I forgot to, to widen my mix when mastering other than the S1 plugin. Uh, yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I'll, I'll actually throw a couple things on here. Let's, I think the audio is still going. I'm going to turn on, uh, what I'll do is I'll put on my, um, I'll put on my, uh, my mix pre-master. Um, there's a few plugins that I really like for this. And it's really easy to overdo it. A um, lot of the lot of the plugin alliance um, plugins now have some sort of like stereoizer, like even just their EQs. And whatever algorithm they're using, I think sounds pretty good. It could just be a simple MS. like it could be just simple like turning turning the sides up. I'm not sure exactly. 
Um, the Vitalizer does something a little bit different, but um, this is probably one of my favorite quote unquote wideners is the stereo expander on this. So let me play this for you guys and you can hear kind of what it's doing. Okay, so here's a caveat. I'm going to mix into this widener. I'm not going to do this at the end because when I did that, the guitars got like hyper stereo and then they got loud. So then I would have had to turn the guitars down. So be careful when you're mastering using like just full, uh, full on wideners. Like I think, again, I don't master. So I don't know, like, is there different tool sets that don't fuck with the levels when you're, when you're using these stereo tools? But when I'm mixing, I, I work them into my mix process. And my goal is, again, I want my mix to sound awesome and wide before it goes to mastering. Um, and if the mastering guy is going to do something to make it even wider, then I, then that's that's something that I just don't want him to do it for the sake of doing it. I want him to be like, yeah, you know what? I think it could be a little bit wider. I think when the chorus opens up, like that would be really that would be a help impact the, the overall mix. Um, going back to, I think what I've said on every video so far, don't just add something or do something to, for the sake of doing it, like do it for a purpose. Like it needs it. Uh, so if the song doesn't need, if the, if the, if the, if the mix doesn't need to get wider, don't, don't do it. Um, but pretty much like this is my favorite widener and you could kind of hear how that was working and a little bit goes a long way. Let me try one other one here. Did you compress the mix beneath the Vox? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking that. Like, um, did I compress the mix beneath the Vox? I mean, these instrumentals, I just muted the, like, obviously when I'm mixing, I'm, I'm setting all my, I'm setting everything based off of what it sounds like with the vocals. So yeah, we're not getting like a really accurate picture of the whole record, but because this is unreleased, I didn't want to put the vocal on. So, um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not like the vocals not running in some different uncompressed bus. Um, I'm not making all my settings on the mix bus or the mastering for the instrumental. This was just, everything was optimized for the actual track. And then I just muted the vocal. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but, um, Jay, the other thing, the other, like, there's so many tools. Like it's like, I mean, um, waves has one called center. Where like it all, literally all it all it's doing is you're just this is the MS you're pulling down the middle. And make sure to adjust your levels. Always be level matching. Don't be fooling yourself. YouTubers don't tell you that, do they? <laughs> Um, yeah, sender's great. Um, uh, there's one other one. Oh, somebody mentioned this earlier. This is actually one that I go to all the time. Um, uh, let's see if this one will actually open. This is the one I used to use. Yeah. So ozone, you can get, uh, you can just use the, the individual modules. I use the image for, for, uh, having a hard time speaking today for whatever reason, this imager two is the one that I like the best when I'm mixing. Now, I typically don't use this on the mix. I actually will use this on specific instruments or buses. So let's hear how this sounds here. Yeah. So there, I mean, there's, we could go like, I, I think probably I could probably pull up a hundred plugins right now that, that widen. I think you got to figure out what works best. Um, you got to figure out what works best for the source material. That's the thing I find. 
Um, some stuff like, for instance, that imager that like I just said how much I love and I use it on so much stuff, but I don't use it on the mix. Just putting, just hearing it on the mix right now, I didn't like it. That's that was my least favorite of the three options I just showed you. Um, they all do it a little bit differently, so you got to figure out what works best. Some some things will work best on a mix. Some things will work best just on guitars. Um, some things I, I some wideners I use just on like reverbs, reverb returns, that kind of stuff. So. Okay, free for all Q and A. Here we go. I'll go back to the chat here. Um, okay. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let me find out where I am. Da -da -da -da. Midside widening thing. We got that. Uh, I have so many questions, Jay. Okay, here's your chance, buddy. <laughs> uh, oh, dude, thank you so much. Um, do I compress? Sorry, Chris Stover. Uh, use your Illusion Records. Bill Price compressed the mix, then vocals sat on top. Tried it a few times. Works great sometimes. Okay, so I oh yeah, so that's what I that's what I thought you meant. Um, I know a lot of guys who have a separate bus. For they have a music bus and they have a vocals bus. The music bus gets squashed the way that I would typically squash the whole mix, right? And then the vocals get put on top with less or no bus compression at all. So, yeah, I, I, I've i tried that. I, for whatever reason, like, um, I just, I, I, I don't have much success. It's, I, I haven't figured out a way to not, to have that not uh, sound disjointed. To me, like, what you just described, uh, I love the Use Your Illusion album. Um, the mixes are so different than everything else but they're so good like and there's it's weird there's such an odd mix um those albums but it's great and there's nothing else that really sounds like that which is which is also strange considering how big those albums were um when i listen to that album that doesn't sound disjointed to me like it doesn't sound like the vocals are sitting on top of an instrumental but every time i try to do that it's i can i can literally picture it in my brain it looks my ears make my brain picture a bunch of vocals sitting on top of an instrumental <laughs> and I can't figure out a way to like smush them together. So I, I personally don't do that, but it's not because of any other reason of like, I just, I can't, I haven't been able to figure out a way to make that work. So, um, Jay never thought of mixing into a widener. Oh dude. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause that will change your levels. It will also change your EQs. Um, I find when you're, when you're doing that, you, I don't want to say you're going to get more mono co compatibility because whatever you're putting it on, like if you put it on a guitar bus, um, like you might, you might lose your guitars in mono if you do too much, but I would much rather like maybe the guitars kind of start to kind of disappear a little bit in mono, but everything else kind of is there. Whereas if you put it on. If you if you put it on a, a the only on the mix bus, depending on how heavy handed you're doing it, sometimes it can fuck with it even more. And the other thing that I find is, um, again, you got to be careful and you got to be listening for it. But if you use different wideners for different things, sometimes it just smears it in such a way where it doesn't sound phasey and fucked up. It just sounds big and wide uh, because it's doing a little bit something different, like. Like if you're using a different widener, like on the electric guitars versus the acoustic guitars or the keyboards or the background vocals, all are using a different type of widener. Sometimes that can just kind of camouflage the, the, the detrimental parts of these wideners. So definitely mix into them. Yeah, Mike, center plus one for sure. Center's awesome. Jeff, if I may, any widener is phase altering. So always check mono for any weird canceling. Oh, 100%. I know I'll tell you this with absolute certainty. If you use a widener, you are going to what are, I like I like I've said this a couple times. Everything's a trade-off. Everything's a trade-off. So, when I put a and I like things really fucking wide, by using a widener, I am trading off mono compatibility for the excitement of like hyper stereo that's a trade-off um i did a i did an album try to remember probably two years ago it was during the like pandemic lockdown 
I'm trying to remember who it was for. Might have been Scott Stapp. Um, can't remember. It doesn't matter. Um, but I got to the end of the mixing, and there was two producers on the album, and one of the producers is like, fuck, I, like, I listen on my, my Bluetooth speaker, and like the guitars just disappear. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, can we fix that? And I'm like, yeah, but we're going to lose like when you're in your car and when you're in your studio and when you have your headphones on and all the other scenarios, it's not going to be as big and exciting. And that was, it, it was probably an hour long conversation. And I went and I did, a, I revised a few mixes. It's a trade-off 100%. So Jeff, you are absolutely right. When you're starting, when you start adding that fake shit, unless you're, unless here's, here's what I will say, because there's another way to widen stuff. But it's not really just widening it. You're actually, you're adding like effects to it. Like I'll use like a, like a harmonizer, like a, like a micro shift. Um, and that get, that actually doesn't put it further out. That actually just gives it a little bit more of, of, of a, of a apparent width. Sometimes that can help and that doesn't really fuck with phase. Um, but if you're, yeah, if you're using like the stereo enhancer, if you're using the MS stuff, if you're using any of that shit, the more you use it, the more you are sacrificing mono capability. That is uh, like like without uh, without question for sure. Uh, I'm gonna try out center. Yep, yep, yep. I think Im Ozone Imager Two is free. Oh, interesting, awesome. I like seeing what synths disappear when I check mixes in mono. <laughs> well, don't look, don't don't check my mixes too hard because I think all the guitars will probably disappear too. <laughs> yeah, if you want drum, bass, and vocal only mixes of any of my any of the stuff I've mixed, all you got to do is just start uh, start checking. Just clap shit to mono, and there you go. Um, yeah, that's what Tom says too. Yeah. Uh, how do you factor tr uh, trigger files when it comes from different velocities? Uh, Daniel and San Quentin does a build up with the uh, snare and toms, but trigger won't change velocity hits for me. How do you mix that? Um, da, 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 da. Jeff, I use I use the stereos all the weekly. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it's a compromise, right? I mean, uh, using a limiter like gets you a certain thing, but causes other problems and, and compressors and everything. Like it's all trade-off. It's all calculated, calculated trade-offs. You get two points here, but give away a point here, but you're still one ahead. Right. So, um, so Jay, I'm gonna come back to your question here. Um, in a second, I'm just gonna finish up with the mono compatibility. Do I find mono compatibility to be that important in today's music landscape to be perfectly honest with you to me? It's totally worth the trade-off to not worry about mono ca compatibility in order to make it awesome in, in every other stereo scenario. Stereo scenario. There's a there's a tagline for you. Um, so I'm aware of it. Here's another rhyme. I'm rhyming. I'm aware of it. I just don't care about it. Um, unless it's an issue for somebody else. So, yeah, if I'm working, if and it's also stylistically, right? If I'm doing big, heavy, like, cartoon rock, um, yeah, I'm less concerned. If I'm doing, like, a, if I'm doing something that's maybe a little bit, uh, <laughs> hashtag, stereo scenario. Um, if I'm doing something that's maybe, like, a little bit more, like, clean and pristine and maybe is a little bit more of a, a you know, a song where it's not quite so um, just, like, overproduced for lack of a better term. I mean, I mean that in a good way. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I, maybe I'll be more aware of it and I probably wouldn't. Here's, here's the thing. I feel like for, for me, when I'm trying to make something wide and exciting, um, I'm not, again, I'm not doing it just to do it. I'm doing it because the music or the production or the part of the song, something is requiring me to do that and if it's the type of music that i think you you're probably going to be a little bit more concerned with the mono uh, compatibility and all that stuff like that you're probably not going to like something's not even going to send you down that road like it's it, you're not even going to go down that road so i don't know 
to me, it's just one of those things where I feel like it just kind of takes care of itself because the thing that if it's something I got to worry about, I'm probably, it's probably not going to like be something I'm reaching for anyways. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I've used, have I used golf Foss? Yeah, I've used golf Foss actually quite a bit. Um, sometimes it works great and other times it doesn't. And to be honest with you, like, I, I like, uh, I've, it doesn't, it doesn't really give me much control. I feel so it's like, it's, it's to me, it's throwing darts. So if I'm having a hard time, like getting something to sit, or if I get it to sit for like these two notes, but then these two notes, it kind of does something different. Sometimes I'll throw that on and I'll, and I'll make it pretty, pretty, uh, uh, um, pretty apparent and just see, I'm like, cool, that solves the problem or whatever it's doing. Just kind of fix the problem. Like fine. Um, I'm definitely not like a golf boss evangelist by any means. I, I, I prefer to have more control and I feel like I don't have that much control with that, with that plugin. Um, don't exactly know kind of what it's doing or how it's doing it. Um, ultimately I don't care if it works, it works. If it doesn't, I turn it off and I go to something else. Um, it's also not the thing I rely upon a lot. It's, I, I, it's not my first, it's not my first like problem solver tool. Um, but yeah, I've, I've used a lot. Uh, ba -ba -ba. agreed. Besides dance and disco, who's mixing in mono? Big guitars are worth the trade off to me. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I mean, obviously, like big guitars panned out wide. Yeah, like fine. Let's 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 go there. I mean, there's other things that I don't want disappearing. You know, mono, obviously. But uh, um, speaking of mono compatibility, I haven't really done a lot of like like clinical tests on this, but I've noticed just a huge surge in all these plugins having like um, these like mono, like frequency dependent, like mono maker things where it's like you just turn the knob and everything below like a hundred Hertz stays in mono. Um, not that anybody's asked me about that lately, but since the conversations about that, I don't find that to actually be very useful. Um, and I've tried it lots. I haven't done any, like, I haven't like run like tones through it or like really done tests to, to really test the theory, but just in terms of like preference and just like making my mixes, like I know some people are like, oh, well you get every, you get everything in the center for, uh, for the low end. And it just, it's more solid to me for whatever reason, maybe it's because of all the other shit I'm doing in a mix. Maybe it's because I like things to be wide and ambient, I, whatever it is. That stuff is does not seem to work for me. I just don't like it. So, but I've been seeing it on like every plugin, and I'm like, oh, I, sh I is that something I should be doing? And I keep on thinking, I'm like, oh, I, I should be making my bass mono, and I'm like, eh, I don't really like it. So, anyways, um, who listens to mono? Stereo scenario. <laughs> uh, Making mix moves with intention, basically the mantra of the live streams. Dude, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Intention, purpose, reason. Um, I, I, I'm not. I, I'm not selling you guys stuff yet, but I will be. I'm actually mapping out uh, and outlining uh, a, a mixing course, um, like everybody else and their mom. Um, but no, I, I hope this one's going to have a little bit of a different philosophy and a different angle. And a, a lot of the focus is on intention, purpose, reason, decision making, um, anticipating um, the why. You know, why am I doing this? Why am I using that tool? Why, 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 why? Because I think when you start asking yourself why, I think you come to different conclusions than if you if you just start doing things because you think you need to or because somebody told you it was cool or because you have the plugin or you know how to use the plugin or whatever right um you start asking yourself why and i think you start coming up with uh with really really captivating and compelling reasons to do things um i can't remember i mean this is probably like a very popular quote but i can't remember where i heard it but i've probably heard it in a few places and um, the quote basically goes like this. If you want better answers, ask better questions. And that to me has been like something I, I think about all the time. And so in, what I'm trying to teach or I'm trying to share or just, you know, even just conversations, it's like I'm, I'm very aware of that. 
And so what I'm trying to do in a lot of this is I'm, I, I don't want to be condescending or preachy, but I kind of want you guys to start asking yourselves, like mixing production, all of this is just problem solving, which are just a bunch of questions, right? Problem solve. How do I solve this? What's the problem? Like, what's the problem? How do I solve it? What do I want it to be? Why is this happening? Like, whatever. And you got to solve all these problems, right? Um, and if you can figure out a way to, like, ask those questions in a better way as opposed to, like, what do I do to fix this? And it's kind of like, okay, well, why is that happening? Maybe that's a better question. Maybe that will help you come to a better answer. So, anyways, that's my uh, that's my Yoda for the night. Um Da, 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 da. Chris, for Thanksgiving, thank you for doing each video. I've taken notes, changed my workflow. Oh, dude, of course. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, like I said, I, 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 I realized I'm doing this on Thanksgiving. I figured uh, probably 75% of our audience tonight is going to be Canadian because <laughs> Canadian Thanksgiving is a month earlier. Um, we don't have to go into why that is, but uh, I appreciate everybody showing up tonight, and I hope there was some uh, some... U.S.-based folks who've got a belly full of turkey and stuffing and mashed, mashed potatoes and all that fun stuff. So, um, okay, let's, uh, man, that's two hours. Let's get, let's wrap up some of these questions and then we'll let everybody go to bed or have dessert. Um, Mono maker stuff useful when I have a sub synth that has a lot of stereo movement. I can lock the subs to the center, but keep the stereo movement. Yeah, yeah sure. Yep. Um, California American here. I quit drinking for this. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, for mono, I'll be honest. TikTok, Instagram creator. I've spent a lot of time in mono because we'll listen on our phones. Ah, oh, interesting. Headphones don't get used on TikTok and Instagram, so I focus on mono a bit more. Interesting consideration I have absolutely never thought of. So that's great. Um, okay, I'm going to go back up to a question. If I haven't answered your question yet, will you re-ask it so we can just bump it to the bottom of this list? Um, I'm going to go back to Jay's question about the triggers. Okay, so I think what you're asking is like the trigger, just some, some sample libraries don't have the same velocity kind of mapping. Um, so I'm just going to actually open trigger here really quickly. Let me switch my screen for you guys. I'm just going to open trigger. So there's a couple things you can play with. Um, oh, I have to plug something. I've got, I've got a sample library and plugin coming out with Drumforge. And I think there's like, you can actually get it. You can sign up for the insiders list and you can get it. Um, if you haven't gotten it already, but, um, the plugin is a way to con is is like a way better way of than this bullshit in trigger here like i love trigger and i use it all the time but like th this part of like shaping the decays is such a pain in the ass to use um and there's a bunch of things that i've always wanted to have control over in a certain way that we built into the plugin the plugin's called arcus um and so if you if you if you're into drum sampling and stuff like that, or ambient samples, or even just like controlling envelopes and stuff like that, um, definitely check it out. And the, the plugin can be used for uh, the plugin can be used for whatever you want, not just for drum samples. It's basically an envelope shaper, which in synthesizers, every single synthesizer has at least one, um, so you can you know just morph the sound however you want. Um, this is basically that, but it's kind of mainly for drums. So, um, so yeah, check that out. Um, it's my plugin. I can, I can shamelessly plug it. <laughs> okay. So Jay, this is what I would play with to try to get your velocities to match up down here. There's this like dynamic section, and this will basically between the velocity curve, see how it's trying to change the curve and the dynamics a knob which will basically limit how much dynamics are being used you should be able to get you should be able to get the like to figure out based off of which sample library and how the how the the triggers were mapped you should be able to figure out something that matches up to everything else 
And this you can, I'm pretty sure you can automate this. If you can't automate it, like, pretty sure you can. Let me just look here. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, you can. Right here. Um, so you you can automate this. So if you just if you just need to have you want that to happen on just a, a certain role or a build up or something like that, literally just just play around with those two settings until it matches up to the like what the live drum's doing, and then once you get it to where you want it, automate it to that to that section, and then you can put it back to the way it was for for everywhere else that you liked it. I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm going to, once, once the, once the drum soap and Arcus is out, like out, out, like everybody can get it and it's out for sale, like regular sale. Um, I'm going to do a live stream where I'm going to just, I'm going to give you guys like the why, that why this thing exists. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how awesome it is. You guys can decide for yourself if it's any good, but I'm just going to tell you why I developed it, why it is what it is and uh i'll give you a little bit of like how we did it because that was fun too so um kj i hope that answered your question uh do i have go-to mix references grant asks um i mean i think my go-to mix references are probably I do, I, I do, but they're they're very like genre based or they're very like stylistic style based, so they're not just the same like three songs all the time. And a lot of time, what I'll do is um, what I've been doing lately actually is, especially if I'm doing something that's like like if somebody sends me a song that sounds like Nickelback, like okay, I kind of know what to do with it, right? Um, I hope I, <laughs> I I hope I know what to do with it. Uh, but if somebody like if somebody sends me a song that maybe is a rock song that's maybe not down that lane or I'm uh, it's got a little bit of a different aesthetic or they want something different sometimes what I'll do is I'll just go into iTunes and I'll start or Apple Music whatever it's called now I'll just go th and I'll I'll go through like top charts and I'll find something that just sticks out to me as being sounding really good um there's usually at any given point you go to any of the charts, there's usually two or three songs and they're not always by the same bands. They're not always by the same mixers. They're not always by the same producers, but there's usually like two or three songs at any given time, any given genre that just sound better than everything else. And sometimes, like I said, sometimes that's because of the arrangement. Sometimes it's because of the tempo. Sometimes it's because of the key, all of that stuff. But um, I mean, I've, I've, I, I've got a couple. I've got a couple mix references that I that I like. I mean, there's a couple like, I'm a huge Randy Staub fan. Obviously, I'm a big Mike Shipley fan. I'm a big Chris Lord Algae fan. Um, you know, there's. I mean, there's quite a few of those guys' mixes that I'm still going back to. Um, I mean, I'm I'm still. I'm still referencing Def Leppard. I'm still rep referencing uh, like, you know, Dr. Feelgood, you know, Kickstart My Heart or Same Old Situation. I'm still referencing Nickelback Dark Horse. I'm still referencing um, um, some of the stuff, like some of the, the, the um, oh, fuck. There's, there's a couple of Chris Lord Algae mixes that like aren't like the big ones. I'm tr and I'm, I'm completely spacing on what they are right now. Um, couple kind of like mid tempo kind of rock songs like even some of like the like the early Daughtry style stuff like some of that like Howard Benson stuff that Chris Lord Algae mixed um I like I I just really 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 solid mixes um but when I'm referencing it's it's I, I'm not really like zoomed in on anything it's more just for like okay do I have enough top end do I have enough bottom end uh, is the kick loud enough? Is the snare loud enough? Is the snare too loud? <laughs> Which is usually my problem. Um, is the vocal too big? Is the vocal not pointy enough? Like it's it's stuff like that. I'm not trying to match sounds. So it's it's more about just finding stuff where you like, you know it sounds good, you know it translates, and then just using it like literally as a reference. It's not it's not a map. It's not a it's not a, a it's not an outline to trace like it's not a something you should be tracing um it's it's a reference right so what's the deal with dithering oh thank you for coming back to that i'm not the best guy to ask about dithering 
Um, do we dither when bouncing in the box? Well, okay, so you're, do we dither when using outboard gear or console? Dither when up sampling? Does dithering even mean anything anymore? Okay, so you're quote unquote supposed to dither if you if you're going from 24 bit to 16 bit. Because otherwise, if you don't dither, the bits I believe are like, like I said, I'm not like super educated on this. I used to be, but basically the like the dithering does something to make up for to it's almost like back in the day when they used to use like Dolby noise reduction units on tape machines. So like it would add a bunch of noise. So that way the tape machine would work more efficiently and then it would like get rid of the noise later. So as far as I know, like dithering adds a certain amount of like kind of kind of fucks with the signal a little bit, but it does it in order to solve a problem that you get, I guess, when like bit sketches get truncated. And so um, dithering, I believe, is still necessary unless all you're doing is if you're if you're if you're staying in 24 bit, um, then you don't have to dither. But if you like if you're mixing, for instance, my mix sessions are usually 24 or 32 bit 48K. When I export a mix or um, if I'm doing like a, a, a 16 bit version for a client ref, um, I will use a, a limiter that has a dither and I will uh, and I will dither it down to 16 bit and even if that limiter is not doing anything, because I've already built that into my mix bus, like I, I will, I will do that process. Or I guess you could just use any sort of app that had a dither or a plugin that had that process. So, um, it's, that's, you know, I should, I should drink my own Kool Aid with that question. I should actually go and do some tests and find out instead of just being like, yeah, people tell me I should. Um, but yeah, you, you used to. I think it used to be a bigger deal than it is, but now like so much. So many platforms live in 24 bit now. Like you can, you can listen to 24 bit out of iTunes. You can listen to 24 bit out of Dropbox. You can listen to 24 bit. Um, you know, some of the even some of the streaming platforms have uh, like high res options. So if you're not going down to 16 bit, you can you don't have to dither. So I'm not the expert on that by any means. So uh, um, I, I maybe I should have just said that. <laughs> um, okay what else we got oh thank you for the uh the soap and arcus love um yeah i think uh it actually got um i think there's an update already there we found out we found a little bit of a bug after we released it with the side chain all the different daws use different side chain ways to implement the side chain and for some reason i think it didn't like pro tools method of side chaining signals so um if you don't have the update get it and if you haven't bought it yet or you haven't tried it out yet then don't worry it will be it'll be ready to go for you so oh okay go eat your turkey buddy what bpm is song on fire random i know but i can't find it song on fire bpm fuck you think i remember that I'm just going to do what you do. I'm going to like tap it out, find a load, load it into pro tools and just use the tap tempo or find, find, a, create a loop and do a identify beat. I don't know. I'll, I'll sing it in my head and tap out a tempo and see how close I can get. I was actually going to say 89. I think it's a little slower than that. For some reason my brain said 89. I pro it, it's probably like high eighties. <laughs> That's the most random fucking question I think I've ever had. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, it's got to be like 86.3784. Oh, I know why you can't find it. I know why you can't nail it. One thing we didn't talk about mastering. Sometimes we change playback speed in mastering for various reasons. I'm thinking maybe that track we did that. Um. How bright is too bright mix wise? Uh, I mean, I, I I guess that's in like the the ear of the beholder. <laughs> um, there's definitely too bright, it, and I think there's a lot of shit out there right now that I feel like is like on the verge of too bright. 
Um, I mean, the, I would say the easiest way to determine if something's too bright is if you turn up the volume, not like ear, like ear splitting loud, but if you turn up the volume and the high end is just like, if you kind of like can't keep your eyes open because you're just like squinting, um, that's too bright. Um, but again, that's where like references are good, right? So for instance, like, like there was, a, there was a, a, a moment in the eighties where shit got really bright and almost harsh. Um, well, let me rephrase. It sounded like it was really bright, but it wasn't actually really bright. It was, it was cause there wasn't a ton of bottom end. And that's why a lot of mixes from the eighties is like really clear. The mixes from the eighties sound so good is cause there's not a lot of, there's not a ton of like muddy bottom end. And the minute you start adding a bunch of bottom end, well, then your mixes start sounding dark. So then you got to add top end. And there's this back and forth game of more bottom, more top, more bottom, more top, more mids, more top, more bottom, more top, more mids. And it's just more, 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 more. And then everything just starts sounding like shit. So um, balance, it it was, yeah, exactly. It was all the cocaine, that too. Um, so like it's, it's, it, there is there is too bright, but usually too bright. The reason why too bright's too bright is because there's too much bottom end. This is why I was talking to tell them about saying about the eighties. Like if you got a lot of bottom end, you gotta have everything else has to be balanced out, right? So you gotta add top end to balance that out. So if you get stuck in this, like, what the fuck? I can't like if I turn the top end down, it's it's not bright enough. And if I turn it up, I'm like, it hurts. Start rolling off some bottom end and then match the top end to that and see what happens. I bet you that probably fixes some of that problem. Not saying you have that problem, but um, that's something that I I used to battle with. Okay, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, what's the catastrophe? How bright is too bright? Any local Chicago band? <laughs> Recorded from 98 to 2006. That's funny. Were the local studios in Chicago, did they have like a certain monitoring system that didn't have any top end? So they just cranked the shit out of it. So, um, KJ, actually, have you ever listened to a song you mixed that the band played live and had like, why did you play it like that with that sound tone thought? Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. I think, I mean... Live is so different from studio and any bands who have worked with me will, <laughs> some of them have like gotten this verbatim. Like I'm not the most like purist as you guys have probably guessed by my productions and my mixing. Like I'm not a purist and I've had like, I, I don't care if something sounds real. I don't care if something sounds accurate. Like, it doesn't, I don't care. I don't care. Like, does it sound cool? Does it sound exciting? Does it fit the song? Does it give, does it, like, does it do what I want it to do, right? Does it give me the feel? Does it give me, does it make me, like, get speeding tickets when I'm driving in my car? Like, I don't care if it's like, yeah, but that's not a real kick drum. I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't care. So when it comes to the live thing, I really disassociate myself with the live aspect of um, songs, um, for better or worse, and I, and I, it's funny because I remember I can remember like four specific times, not getting into arguments, but almost like having to like just put my foot down, and when producing a band, and they're like, "Well, how are, like, we can't do that? We how are we going to do that live?" And my answer is all the same. That's not my fucking problem. My problem, my job is to make your album sound fucking awesome. My problem is not to figure out how you're going to recreate this live. I don't give a shit. And I know, that, and I, and I, I mean, I obviously like play it up for effect and for, for dramatics and to prove a point, but that's kind of like, that's a little bit of my philosophy, like how somebody, how a band recreates it live. I don't want to say is it, like, I don't care because I like going to shows and I like it sounding good. But that's not my, people are not hiring me to be like, okay, I want you to produce my record so that way when we play it live, it sounds really good. And it's like, no, no, no. My job is to produce a record that when it comes out of speakers or headphones or whatever other medium you might, <laughs> I, I don't know what other mediums there are, but whatever, that that's my job. And if that means adding eight guitars because 
eight guitars sound better than one, even though there's only one guitar player in the band. Cool. Ben, you guys can figure that out later. And I'm typically not getting hired by the bands who that's important to them. So, um, yeah, Too Bright can absolutely happen because of monitoring situation. But again, that's why you check it everywhere, right? Check it on 10 different systems. Check it on different headphones. Um, figure out references, right? If, if Def Leppard hysteria sounds dull on your monitoring system, then your monitoring system is probably a little dull, <laughs> right? So, um, plate reverb on stun and all of the trouble on everything. Yeah, no kidding. Gotta go. Grant, thanks for, sh thanks for dropping in, buddy. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the mixing course. Yeah, that's probably going to be a little bit down the road, so don't hold your breath, but that, it will be coming. It's just very beginning stages, and, you know, I like to, I, like I said, with my mixing, I'm not fast, but I, I hope that uh, by the time I'm done, it's it's something that everybody loves. So I'm, I'm taking that same approach with with the mixing course. Um, and I will, I will absolutely take your money. <laughs> uh, Jay, not my problem. Yep, that's what I say. Okay, I'm going to call. All right, I think everybody's ready. Um, guys, thank you so much. I love, like I said, I love doing these. Um, I have so much fun. I, the Q&As are my favorite. Um, at some point, I'm going to figure out a way for us to do a Q&A where I can get everybody up on the screen. Everybody can be a part of this. Um, you know, whether it be with Zoom or something else, I, I, I would love to do that. Um, I've also been toying just to kind of tease a few things. I've also been toying with the idea of doing some in-person workshops, um, picking a couple major cities across North America um, and doing some workshops on various topics, recording bands, mixing, editing, producing, big picture, kind of more philosophical and conceptual stuff. Um, so this is only the beginning. And the more that you guys participate, the more that you guys ask questions, the more that you guys watch, the more that you share, it just gives me more motivation and more ambition and, and just really encourages me to do this. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm probably not going to be on next week, the week after. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on the socials, keep an eye on the channel, subscribe, follow, share, all the fun stuff. And um, by all means, feel free to reach out and ask questions or if you've got any topic suggestions, that type of stuff. I'm, I am all ears. Um, I really appreciate all you guys. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody in the States or anywhere else that uh, might be celebrating Thanksgiving today. And uh, until next time, take care, stay safe, be well. Peace.